Good morning. The subcommittee will come to order, and the chair recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. And again, good morning, and welcome to today's oversight hearing of the Federal Communications Commission. I want to begin by welcoming the commissioners back to the subcommittee. It's been over a year since the commission last testified before us, and to say we have a lot to cover in today's hearing would be an understatement. The FCC is an independent agency charged by Congress to regulate interstate and international communications by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable. Its responsibilities include administrating the Universal Service Fund, the USF, holding spectrum auctions, and regulating broadcast licenses. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Congress added to the list by charging the FCC with administering the Affordable Connectivity Program, the ACP, the Energy Connectivity Fund, and the COVID-19 Telehealth Program, totaling billions of dollars. Closing the digital divide is a key priority for this committee. Last month, the FCC released an updated version of its national broadband map, which showed that 8.3 million homes and businesses still lack access to high-speed broadband. This map produced in accordance with the bill I led, the Broadband Data Act, is significantly better than previous maps. But concerns with pre-production draft that overstated coverage in some areas and missed communities in others highlight the need for oversight of the effort. This oversight is especially important because the National Telecommunications Information Administration plans to use this latest map to make allocations to states for $42 billion in the BEAD program on June 30. With a huge amount of money at stake, we need confidence these maps are accurate so states get the right allocation to connect all their unserved and underserved residents. As I mentioned, the FCC administers the, F the USF, the ACP, the ECF programs. Congress' significant investment in broadband raises questions about the future of the USF. For example, what, if any, should the USF fund once the infrastructure money is spent? How should Congress address duplicative programs like ACP and Lifeline, and who should contribute to the USF? I hope today's discussion will answer these questions. Unfortunately, we also know these programs are ripe with waste, fraud, and abuse. The FCC Inspector General has issued two uh, advisories related to enrollment fraud in ACP and its predecessor program, the Emergency Broadband Benefit, two programs creating response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And earlier this year, the Government Accountability Office found the FCC did not have the adequate anti-fraud controls, anti controls for the program. It is my hope that the Commission takes these findings seriously and implements the right oversight and controls to prevent additional fraud from taking place. Finally, we need to fully fund the Supply Chain Reimbursement or the Rip and Replace Program, which Congress created to help small providers remove unsecure equipment from the networks. This committee unanimously passed H.R. 3565, the Spectrum Auction Reauthorization Act, to immediately address the shortfall and restore the FCC's Spectrum Auction Authority, which expired on March the 9th. Providers are required to begin the process of removing the equipment by July the 15th, and they need the certainty they can get reimbursed for their efforts. This is a serious problem, especially for rural America. Without these funds, small carriers could be forced to shut down their networks, leaving their customers without a connection. We cannot let this happen and need the full House and Senate to act on this legislation immediately. I look forward to discussing the important issues before the Commission and thank the Commission for being with us today. And I now recognize the General Lady from California, the Ranking Member of the Subcommittee, for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome the Commissioners who are here today. On March 9th of this year, the Commission's auction authority expired. The very next day, the subcommittee held a hearing. Ironically, the title of that hearing was Defending America's Wireless Leadership. As I said at that hearing, allowing this authority to lapse was a failure. To add insult to injury, it was a completely avoidable failure. I think I can speak for the members of this subcommittee when I say allowing this rolling lapse to continue is unacceptable. The stakes are simply too high. In May, the Energy and Commerce Committee once again passed a bill to reestablish FCC auction authority, reassert the statutory role of civilian agencies, and fund vital national security initiatives. Until we pass that bill, economic and national security imperatives 
who remain in limbo. One of the most pressing is our unfinished work, ripping and replacing vulnerable Chinese gear in our networks. I say that because without additional funding, the FCC will be forced to prorate reimbursements on July 17th. As an original co-sponsor of the Secure and Trusted Networks Act, I can say with confidence, Congress didn't mandate the removal of some of this gear. We mandated the removal of every last piece. We did that because it's a clear and immediate national security threat. Passing the Spectrum Auction Realization Act would also remove any uncertainty about the FCC's ability to grant 2.5 gigahertz licenses that are sitting unused. Companies with service footprints across the country are eager to put this spectrum to use. T-Mobile alone is waiting for the FCC to approve more than 7,000 licenses with a collective value of more than $300 million. For these reasons and more, I'm hopeful the House will vote on the Bipartisan Spectrum Auction Reauthorization Act as soon as possible. It'll then be up to the Senate to join us in this effort, and I sincerely hope they do. But there's much more we need to discuss today because the FCC's authority is vast and there's a lot of important work ahead of us. Most importantly, we need to stay committed to keeping American families connected. That bipartisan infrastructure law established the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP, to help families afford a broadband connection. Whether that's for the first time or when you need a little extra help making ends meet, the ACP program is working. This program now helps more than 18 million households pay for the internet service. And like the law that created it, it remains steadfastly bipartisan. Republican governors across the country are witnessing this program in action and praising its effectiveness. Governor Ivey of Alabama called the ACP a great resource for Alabamians to get help paying for the internet. Governor Lombardo of Nevada said, we need to make sure all Nevadans have a chance to connect, which is why we are committed to helping families access high-speed internet through the ACP. And just yesterday, Senator Wicker led a group of eight Republican senators urging the White House to ensure the continuity of funding for this program. I ask unanimous consent that this letter be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. This bipartisan support reflects ACP's successes. It keeps families connected, provides new customers for broadband companies, and it grows the economy. Now with that, I want to thank Chairwoman Rosenwartzo and the commissioners for being here today. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, the chair of the full committee, for five minutes. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Chairman Latta. Welcome back to Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Commissioners Carr and Starks and Symington. There's a lot on the agenda today. Since the last time you were before this committee, in March of 2022, the FCC spec Spectrum Auction Authority has expired for the first time ever. The FCC stood up its Space Bureau and the Office of International Affairs. Multiple versions of new broadband maps have been released. FCC Inspector General advisories have identified waste, fraud, and abuse in multi-billion dollar programs that were created to keep Americans connected during COVID. And a major merger under review that cleared the Department of Justice languished for more than 400 days at the FCC, a new record. This merger review was denied by FCC Bureau staff rather than considered at the full commission level. This is an unprecedented move by the commission. Your agency also plays a key role in managing our nation's airwaves, a vital task. In order for the U.S. to lead in the next generation technologies, the commercial industry must have access to spectrum. This committee has prioritized providing the FCC with the tools it needs to manage our nation's airwaves effectively. Unfortunately, a key tool used by the FCC, the authority to issue spectrum licenses, expired earlier this year for the first time ever. I've been working with my colleagues in the House for over a year and with colleagues in the Senate to extend this authority. Earlier this year, the committee unanimously passed H.R. 3565, 
the Spectrum Auction Reauthorization Act to extend the FCC's auction authority for three years, fund the shortfall in the rip and replace program, and support our first responders through upgraded 911 networks. We're continuing to work on advancing this legislation out of the House, through the Senate, and onto the President's desk to sign. This committee is also prioritizing closing the digital divide, and the FCC has a key role to play in that effort. I'm pleased that the Commission has released two versions of the broadband maps since our last oversight hearing. These maps are significantly better than the previous FCC maps, and we need to make sure that the FCC gets this right in order to ensure every person can participate in today's economy. $42 billion has been allocated to this effort, and we must be able to trust that these maps are correct and that this money is going to unserved communities. This money cannot be wasted, which we're un unfortunately seeing in some of the other FCC programs. Since 2021, the FCC Inspector General has released two advisories warning of fraud in the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP. Congress provided over $17 billion for this program to help low-income individuals afford broadband. This fraud undermines confidence in the program and the FCC's ability to administer it. This is especially concerning as Congress considers the future of ACP. The FCC also has been active in the media marketplace. In March 2022, Standard General announced its proposed acquisition of Tegna, which manages 64 television stations in 51 U.S. markets. The transition passed review unchallenged by the Department of Justice. Then, in an unprecedented manner, the FCC delegated the decision to the Media Bureau, which was directed to punt this decision to an administrative law judge. It takes the administrative law judge an average of 799 days to complete the hearing process. Delegating this decision to an administrative law judge hearing effectively kills this deal. You are all con confirmed by the Senate to take votes on these types of decisions. The chair's decision to delegate this matter to, matter to career officials is really of question today. This hearing, this oversight hearing of the Commission reaffirms our commitment to ensuring agencies under the jurisdiction of this committee are held accountable, uses the resources allocated to them responsibly, and stays on mission. Chairwoman Rosenworcel, Commissioners Carr, Starks, and Symington, I thank you for being here, and I look forward to our discussion. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Lada. This is the second oversight hearing of the SCC since Chairwoman Rosenworcel has taken over, and unfortunately, it's also our second hearing with only four commissioners before us. And we need an FCC that is at full capacity with five commissioners, and I still hope that the Senate will finally make this happen soon. Fortunately, the lack of a full commission has not stopped the FCC from tackling important issues. The impressive bipartisan work reflects positively on Chairwoman Rosenworcel's leadership and on the ability of all four of you uh, to work together, compromise, and largely put the needs of people over partisan politics. And thanks to the Commission's bipartisan efforts to rapidly stand up the emergency broadband benefit and its successor, the Affordable Connectivity Program, millions of American families have seen their internet bills reduced by $30 a month and $75 if they're on tribal lands. And these are significant savings that are helping more than 18 million families afford the monthly costs associated with broadband service. It's not surprising that the Affordable Connectivity Program has received bipartisan praise from governors, state officials, and experts nationwide. We must come together to ensure that the program continues to receive the funding that is necessary to make the internet more affordable for millions of American families. Now, the program is also going to play an important role in ensuring that our historic broadband deployment investments don't end up building infrastructure that goes unused because people at the other end can't afford it. So last month, the Commission released the latest version of the National Broadband Map, the product of the Bipartisan Broadband Data Act that we moved through this committee a few years ago. 
The map is critical to the implementation of the $42 billion broadband equity, access, and deployment program in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Accurately mapping unserved and underserved communities is going to allow the Biden administration to use these historic investments to expand high-speed internet access to communities that have been left behind far too long. For years, Democrats and Republicans have complained about the lack of accurate broadband maps, and so I applaud your you on advancing this effort. Although the maps have taken center stage as, it, as we get closer to the broadband equity, access, and deployment state allocations, I want to acknowledge the hard work of the agency to deliver and continue to improve what is surely the most granular broadband map we've ever had. The goal is to close the digital divide in these communities so they can grow their economy for the future. I'd also like to commend the FCC for its work on implementing the Martha Wright Read Act to end predatory phone rates being charged to incarcerated people and their families. The commission also adopted rules promoting broadband competition in condos and apartment buildings to help lower costs and provide additional options, a first of its kind broadband nutrition label, giving consumers more transparency into internet access plans. These are all pro-consumer rules that provide consumers the tools they need to make the internet more affordable. Of course, there's still more work to be done, for instance, despite some significant steps forward with my TRACED Act, robocalls remain not only annoying, but dangerous. Your requests for additional authority have not gone unheard, and I am determined to continue working to put an end to this problem once and for all. So I'll be introducing legislation in the coming months to fix loopholes that allow these calls to continue, update the authorities of our expert agencies, and empower consumers. Similarly, you've told us that we're facing a shortfall in the rip and replace program. Removing Huawei and ZTE and other suspect equipment is a critical national security issue. And I assure you that we're working hard to make sure that program doesn't come up short. And the agency's lapsed spectrum authority that the chairwoman mentioned not only deprives the commission of a core agency function, but it impacts a massive sector of our economy and jeopardizes our global wireless leadership. So I'm proud of the bipartisan action that this committee has taken to rectify the situation, and we will not rest until we get that process back on track, and we must restore the FCC spectrum auction authority. And finally, I, I remain concerned about the, la the last administration's reversal of net neutrality authority. This reversal leaves consumers without protection when it comes to bad behavior by broadband providers. Broadband is the central communications technology of our day, and yet we don't have a broadband regulator, and that means consumer protections are falling by the wayside, so we need to fix that. But again, thank you, thank all four of you for joining us today and all the work uh, that you've done uh, successfully and on a bipartisan basis. And with that, to Chairman Lada, I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you. The gentleman yields back, and uh, that will end our opening statements from our uh, members. Our witnesses today include the Honorable Jessica Rosenworcel, the chair of the FCC, the Honorable Brendan Carr, the uh, commissioner, Honorable Jeffrey Starks, commissioner, and also uh, Honorable Nathan Symington, uh, commissioner of the FCC. I'd like to note for the witnesses that the timer light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining, and will turn red when your time has expired. I also just want to make a quick point again that we do have another subcommittee running upstairs, so we're going to have members shuffling back and forth throughout the morning. Health started at 10, and we, of course, started at 10.30. I'd also just like to uh, take a point of personal privilege to recognize our for former chairman of uh, the uh, full committee, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, for being with us today, who always is looking down from us. Uh, <laughs> see, her presence is always felt, but welcome back. Uh, uh, Chairman Morrison Russell, uh, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning, Chair McMorris Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, Chair Lada, and Ranking Member Matsui, as well as members of the subcommittee. Since I appeared before you last, a lot has happened at the Federal Communications Commission. With the pandemic behind us, it has become clear that broadband is no longer just nice to have, it's need to have for everyone everywhere. Network security is needed by everyone everywhere. Effective public safety communications are needed by everyone everywhere. And every consumer should be the beneficiary of innovation from competitive markets with services that are open, reliable, affordable, and fair. 
We are meeting this moment at the commission by turning down the noise and ramping up the work. Let me explain how. First, we set up the Affordable Connectivity Program. It is the largest broadband affordability program in our nation's history, and it now helps nearly 19 million households get online and stay online. Second, we are fighting for consumers by promoting competition. We develop broadband labels that look just like the nutrition labels you see at the grocery store. Every carrier will need to use them so that every one of us can compare service plans. And we proposed all-in pricing to stop junk fees on cable and satellite bills. On top of that, we took action to help those who live in apartment buildings by ending sweetheart deals that landlords sometimes cut, making residents stuck with one broadband provider and shutting them off from competition. Third, we built the national broadband map. It is the most accurate broadband map in our nation's history, and it is designed to be iterative. That means it is always improving. Fourth, we are helping connect the most vulnerable. We are using the Safe Connections Act to improve access to communications for survivors of domestic violence. We are using the Martha Wright Reed Act to finally address the sky-high rates for communications for families of the incarcerated. And this month, we took action to make the video conferencing platforms that became so popular during the pandemic accessible to those with disabilities. Fifth, we are doubling down on efforts to stop scam robocalls and robotexts. That means we've required new technologies in our networks. We are using new and creative enforcement tools. And we have new allies. Under my watch, we have developed partnerships with 44 state attorneys general to fight robocalls and robotexts. And to the six remaining, I'm coming for you because nobody likes this junk. Sixth, we are helping connect people to emergency services. Next month is the one-year anniversary of the commission setting up 988. That's the easy to remember three-digit hotline to reach out to for suicide prevention and mental health assistance. Under my watch, we've also made it available for texting, not just phone calls, and it is making a difference. Last month, nearly twice as many people used this number as the old 10-digit hotline number from a year earlier. Seventh, we're doing a lot to keep our network safe. We have published the first ever list of communication services that pose an unacceptable risk to national security. We're working with carriers to remove insecure Chinese equipment from their networks. And we are laser-like focused on consumer security with the first ever privacy and data protection task force at the commission. Eighth, we are working to make our networks more resilient. We've seen snow in Texas, hurricanes on the Gulf Coast and wildfires out west, and every one of those events puts communications at risk. In response, we have developed the Mandatory Disaster Response Initiative for the first time requiring roaming and mutual aid from carriers so that when the unthinkable occurs, our calls are all more likely to go through. Ninth, we have launched the Space Bureau. The space economy is growing fast, and also growing are the number of satellite applications before the commission. We are reorganizing to support this growth and ensure that in the new space age, the United States leads. Tenth, but not last, we are building the wireless future. We have held two mid-band spectrum auctions, identified more than 1,000 megahertz of spectrum for new use in the 12 and 13 gigahertz band, and are organizing for our 6G future with networks that feature dynamic access technologies, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But we need your help. Because for the first time in three decades, the agency spectrum auction authority has expired. We need it back. Because using this tool, the commission has distributed wireless licenses in 100 auctions and raised more than $233 billion for the United States. This is the tool that has made us the worldwide leader in wireless. We need this tool back because we do not intend to cede that title to anyone else. I want to thank my colleagues who have been an integral part of all of these efforts, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your statement. Uh, Commissioner Carr, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Latta, Ranking Member Matsui, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify. I want to start by commending this body for its continued leadership on initiatives that will increase Americans' access to affordable, high-speed, broadband. One example is the Satellite and Telecommunications Streamlining Act. So I want to applaud the bipartisan leadership that Chair Rogers and Ranking Member Pallone have demonstrated in moving that bill forward. The legislation would strengthen America's space-based leadership while promoting competition and encouraging businesses to base their operations here in the U.S. 
I also want to applaud members for their work on the American Broadband Deployment Act, as well as the recently passed bipartisan federal land reforms bill that would accelerate broadband infrastructure builds. Streamlining infrastructure rules is vital to the nation's effort to close the digital divide. So I encourage swift passage of those smart bills. At the commission, I've welcomed the chance to work with many of you and my FCC colleagues to advance the public interest. I'd like to highlight a few of those areas today. First, extending US leadership in wireless has been one of my top priorities. In my first few years in this job, I was pleased with the fast actions the FCC took on Spectrum. All told, those Spectrum initiatives opened up more than six gigahertz of licensed Spectrum for 5G, in addition to thousands of megahertz of unlicensed Spectrum. But there's more that we can and should be doing on Spectrum. For one, the FCC itself should formally identify target bands that are underutilized. I set out some ideas on this front in a Spectrum calendar that I previously released. For another, Congress should act to restore the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority, which lapsed for the first time ever. At bottom, a swift acceleration in FCC Spectrum action is vital, as studies increasingly show that the U.S. will soon face a significant Spectrum shortfall. Turning from Spectrum to infrastructure, we need to make even more progress on permitting reform. At the FCC, we should bring fresh urgency to this effort, including by examining whether we should extend some of our decisions on small cells and 5G builds to fiber and other high-speed offerings. The government should also look at modernizing our approach to broadband builds that cross federal lands. Getting approval from all the federal agencies that manage those lands has long been an impediment, particularly for reaching rural communities. In fact, we often hold state and local governments to tighter timelines than the federal government itself. I think this needs to end. And permitting reform is especially vital as we sit here today because the Commerce Department is poised to allocate about $42 billion to states for the expansion of high-speed internet. Without permitting reform, those dollars simply will not go as far as Congress intended. Now, the influx of those federal dollars also highlights the ongoing shortage of broadband workers. The tower crews and uh, telecom techs needed to build out internet infrastructure. Bolstering this workforce will not only accelerate internet builds, it'll create thousands of good paying jobs. And that's why I launched a jobs initiative that looks to community colleges and technical schools as pathways into the industry. And just recently, I had the chance to join Commissioner Starks at Virginia State University and HBCU for a broadband and 5G workforce training event. It was a good example of the types of initiatives that can play a key role in meeting our workforce challenge. In addition to supporting the build out of high speed networks, the FCC has also been busy working to safeguard our networks from entities that threaten our national security. We need to keep making progress here too. To do so, the federal government should take action on several additional fronts. For one, the FCC should build on our actions in the section 214 context by opening a new proceeding to examine whether we should prohibit regulated carriers from directly interconnecting with entities that have been deemed a national security risk. For another, the FCC should publish a list of every entity with an FCC license or authorization that has sufficient ties back to a foreign adversary, including communist China. I would imagine that this is a fairly lengthy list at this point. This action would help ensure that a range of stakeholders can provide any relevant information about national security threats that those entities may pose. One bill that would accomplish this is the Bipartisan FACT Act that Congresswoman Stefanik and Congressman Khanna have introduced, so I support those efforts. In closing, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you very much for your statement. Uh, Commissioner Starks, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Latta, Ranking Member Matsui, Chairwoman McMorris-Rogers, and Ranking Member Pallone, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you here today. The last time that I appeared before this body, I remarked that we stood at an inflection point in our communications history. I continue to believe that is the case. Broadband has emerged as a linchpin 
of opportunity in our modern economy, creating a new sense of urgency to connect all Americans everywhere. At the same time, wireless networks continue to evolve to new and vastly more capable technology generations, driving the need for ubiquity and greater access to, scarce, uh, to the scarce commodity that we call spectrum. Amidst our great interconnectedness, we also face new threats from bad actors and foreign adversaries. Now more than ever, our network security is national security. In the age of online job boards, telehealth, and the homework gap, millions of Americans remain without a home broadband connection. For far too many of them, affordability is the key reason why. In response to the problem, Congress established the Affordable Connectivity Program, ACP, which we have implemented. As of June 12th, 18.68 million households were enrolled in ACP. That figure includes more than 100,000 households in 36 states, 10,000 households in all 50 states, and at least 100 households in several thousand rural zip codes, including more than 80% of non-metro counties. Our wireless network continue to transform the way we live, work, learn, build, and communicate. At the end of last year, US mobile carriers launched 5G networks in more than 500 American cities surpassing China's count for the very first time. To ensure that this pace of innovation in wireless continues and that it benefits all Americans, our networks need to grow in their capability, in their coverage, and in the choice that they offer consumers. As we expand access, increase our connected capabilities, we have even more reason to ensure that our networks remain secure. In 2019, I called for the United States to find it, fix it, fund it. That is to identify uh, insecure equipment on our US telecommunication networks, remove that equipment, replace it with equipment from trusted resources. Through your actions in the Secure and Trusted Communications Act, we are now in the process of implementing that rip and replace programming and we must continue to uh, work together to address this ongoing threat and finalize that remediation process. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Commissioner Symington, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Latta, Vice Chair Carter, Ranking Member Matsui, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is a privilege to appear before you today. In my opening remarks at last year's oversight hearing, I discussed my three policy-making priorities within the commission, securing wireless devices <coughs> against cyber attacks, putting in place orbital debris rules that will ensure that Earth orbit is a natural resource that is as available to future generations as it is to us, and improving receiver performance to make it faster and cheaper to newly commercialize or repurpose spectrum. Many have attempted to characterize the commission as deadlocks, uh, deadlocked, at least until another confirmation can jolt us back to life. But the facts reveal the opposite, a commission totally committed to the public interest and faithful implementation of congressional mandates. I'm pleased to say, for example, that we've made great progress in all three areas that I've listed. On the security front, we have banned untrustworthy Chinese Communist Party-controlled equipment from our networks and continue to explore how to further incorporate cybersecurity standards in our equipment authorization rules. Regarding orbital debris management, we instituted a requirement that low Earth orbit satellite operators safely deorbit their satellites within five years of the end of their mission. And I'd like to thank uh, Committee Chairman Morris Rogers and Ranking Member Matsui for their work on the proposed Satellite Streamlining and Spectrum Coexistence Acts, respectively, both of which I very much support. Concerning receivers, the Commission issued a policy statement detailing how receiver performance is essential for making the best use of scarce and valuable spectrum and how it can be integrated into future spectrum policy making. This pushes back against the practice of forcing inefficient, lighter use of new licenses to protect old backward receivers that ought to be replaced. And so I look forward to modifying FCC processes to allow the Commission to put these principles into action in future rulemaking. In my remarks today, I want to focus on three other important issues facing the FCC. First, I can't emphasize enough how vital it is that the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority is renewed. The auction system for commercializing spectrum has been a resounding success and in fact earned its architect a Nobel Prize in economics. 
it is ensured that valuable spectrum gets put to the highest and best use, and it has kept the United States the global leader in wireless communications. It has been copied by countries around the world. The private sector's thirst for spectrum to serve public demand is unquenchable, and any amount of greenfield spectrum made available for new commercial use can represent many millions of dollars worth of innovation and productivity gains for the American economy, not to mention revenues for the US Treasury. The FCC should also proceed with its work on improving reception and coexistence to retain Congress's confidence that our work on spectrum commercialization is driving efficiency and modernization, not just uptake. I know there are some contentious issues surrounding the renewal of the FCC's authority, and I just want to thank Congress for its diligent work on resolving them while committing to get more out of spectrum that's already commercialized. Second, the Commission should adopt rules allowing all exercises of delegated authority to be timely reviewed by the full Commission. The FCC chair has broad discretion in delegating matters to career officials and political appointees, which restricts those matters from the review, comment, and voting of the full commission. This weakens, in my opinion, congressional oversight by removing accountability from Senate-confirmed officials. In light of the questions raised in recent litigation about the scope of administrative discretion, I still believe that it is in Congress's interest for administrative agencies to retain discretion on issues that are too granular for Congress to effectively address. However, this is likely to be challenged in the courts or by Congress itself if we abuse this discretion by taking issues away from the commission and giving them without timely recourse to the staff. Third, funds for the Affordable Connectivity Program are due to expire next year, and the question of whether and in what form to reauthorize it is before you. Commission staff did a diligent and praiseworthy job implementing the provisions of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and I want to thank them for that. Unfortunately, considering our experience with the Universal Service Fund Lifeline Program, I fear that waste, fraud, and abuse will be a continuing issue with this program, and indeed, cases have already been uncovered. It is crucial to implement foolproof procedures for verifying eligible individuals who actually need the service at the receiving end of the benefit. I welcome ACP uptake to get Americans online and able to access needed resources for modern life. However, if Congress wants the program to endure, the FCC should look into the factors going into adoption to ensure that ACP dollars are indeed driving adoption and uptake, not merely acting as a subsidy for broadband service that consumers would have purchased anyway. I look forward to engaging with you and your colleagues in the Senate as you consider whether and in what form to renew this program. Chairman Latta. Vice Chair Carter, Ranking Member Matsui, and uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you again for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you for your opening statement, and we also want to thank the commissioners again for being with us today. And at this time, uh, we will begin questions from the members of the subcommittee, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Last month, the FCC released the second version of the Broadband Data Act maps. The first version of this map, while better than previous FCC maps, had significant issues. Uh, Madam Chair, what has changed since version one, and how confident are you in the accuracy of the most recent version so that NTIA can use it to make the state allocations? Thank you for the question. We have produced the most accurate broadband maps in our nation's history. The old maps we had, we're light years behind what we have now today. We've got 114 million households we've identified by latitude and longitude, and we have recognized that there are 8.3 million households that have no service. But we are gonna continue to work not just with our colleagues at NTIA, but also with state broadband authorities across the country, get their input, get their facts, and make sure that that data keeps on getting better all the time. And we'd certainly be happy to share those changes with you because it's our goal to produce these maps twice a year under the law, and like I said in my open statement, they will always be improving. Well, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carr, what's your assessment of the current map? Uh, well, Chairman Latta, first of all, thank you for your leadership on the Broadband Data Act. We had uh, bipartisan recognition for years that our old maps were not fit for purpose for what we needed them to, and the, the Broadband Data Act you helped get across the finish line ensure that we are where we, we are today, which is that first version of the map that came out uh, six months ago or so, there was a lot of concern with it, but I think all the feedback that I'm seeing in my own analysis of this map shows that it is improved. Uh, and as the chair said, it's gonna be an iterative process. We need to continue to work with state broadband offices, including to make sure that they're using that map, not just for the initial allocation decision that Commerce will make, um, but as they decide where the funding can go, because this map can also play a key role in preventing overbuilding and make sure we're targeting unserved areas. Well, thank you. Madam Chair, uh, since your elevation to the chair of the commission, the FCC has adopted most items by a uh, four to zero vote. As an independent agency responsible for technical expertise in administrating the Communications Act, 
It's refreshing to see the commission acting in a bipartisan way without straying too far outside of your authorizing statute or exerting regulatory overreach. Tomorrow, the Senate is considering the nominees that would restore the commission to its full strength of five commissioners. Should a fifth commissioner be confirmed, do you commit to continuing to pursue an agenda that will maintain the strong bipartisan agreement and practice regulatory restraint similar to actions taken by the commission under a 2-2 split? Well, I'm proud of the work we've been able to accomplish as a four-member agency. Like I said in my opening statement, we've turned down the noise and we've ramped up the work. But I also recognize that Congress intended this body to have five members, so I look forward to that day coming sooner rather than later. But we'll continue to operate in a collegial way with every one of my colleagues, no matter who they are and no matter how many we have. Thank you. Commissioner Carr, since 2020, Congress has provided significant funding for broadband deployment, affordability, distance learning, and telehealth. USF also funds these activities. How do you view the future of the USF in light of these new programs? Uh, Chairman, thanks for the question. For years, maybe even decades, the FCC's Universal Service Program was the lion's share of all federal support for broadband builds, for digital divide efforts. Uh, and now we're seeing a lot of efforts across many other agencies as well. There was a GAO report recently that said that we now have something like 130 programs spread across 15 agencies. So I think the time is ripe right now to make sure that we have a, a coordinated approach to all these different broadband programs. And I think that can start with a big think about how does USF fit within those other programs. There's some good legislation that would do that, including from members uh, here, Congressman Wahlberg, Congressman Custer, uh, the PLAN Act, which would ensure better coordination across all of that. Well, thank you. Let me follow up, uh, Commissioner Carr. On July the 17th, participants in the Rip and Replace program were required to submit their first uh, claims for reimbursement. This committee has acted twice, but unless Congress acts before July the 17th, this program will not be fully funded. What will happen if Congress fails to act, and what are the implications for national security and also for rural America? Yeah, the, if we don't fully fund Rip and Replace quickly, uh, there's going to be very serious real-world consequences. The insecure gear is going to come out, but the challenge is having the funding for these small providers to replace it. And so in some extreme circumstances, we could even see small rural ISPs uh, and other sort of uh, wireless providers that might be the only option in an area could potentially go out of business. Uh, otherwise, entities could stay in business, but they'd have holes in coverage, which itself is a public safety challenge. So I do think we need to make good on our commitment uh, to all of these providers to fully fund Rip and Replace. Well, and it's absolutely essential. And I know we've had a lot of discussions, uh, not only on the subcommittee and full committee, and also with you as the commissioners, but we've got to get this thing done. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, making sure that as we move things out of the House and get it over to the Senate, that, uh, that they can bring these things up. My time has expired, and I will submit my uh, uh, extra questions I had that I wasn't able to get to for the, uh, for the um, later for to be answered, and uh, I will now recognize the general lady from California, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. The uh, ACP is helping more than 18 million households afford a broadband connection. Whether that's for the first time or getting after getting laid off, the ACP is working. Madam Chair, can you briefly describe the relationship between the ACP and broadband deployments through the BEAD program? Thank you for the question. I think that relationship is really important. After all, Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law with both of these programs. They work hand in hand. The BEAD program supports deployment, and the affordable connectivity program supports subscribership. These two programs need to go together. That's how we make sure that we solve the digital divide in this country. Thank you. Commissioner Starks, briefly, could you describe the geographic footprint of the ACP and its effect on both rural and urban communities? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, I, I, I think both of these programs, we see that there are a significant number of ACP enrollees in BEAD spaces. And in fact, BEAD and the build out commitments that folks are going to have to make, providers are going to have to make, uh, they have to offer an affordable option as well. And so I also agree that uh, the footprint that's going to be expanded through BEAD uh, is also going to be very important uh, as it um, has a synergy with ACP. Okay. Thank you. Um, as an original co-sponsor of the Rip and Replace Bill, I believe we must be unwavering in our commitment to get every single piece of vulnerable Chinese gear out of our networks. Madam Chair, could you describe the consequences if Congress 
fails to address the $13 billion shortfall in rip and replace funding by July 17. Thank you. Like my colleague, Commissioner Carr said, we need to get this equipment out of our nation's networks, and the small carriers that have it are going to face a tough choice. They're either going to file with us and request support to remove it, but only get paid about 40 cents on the dollar, or they will leave this equipment in their networks. That's a really unacceptable choice, and I think that we need to work with Congress to make sure we fully fund this program and get this insecure equipment out of our nation's okay. networks. Thank you. Um, I'm sure too many I sound like a broken record, but I believe it's a national security and economic imperative for the U.S. government to speak with one voice on spectrum governance. Madam Chair, in the run-up to the WRC, do you believe a protracted lapse in auction authority has implications for our standing in the international community? Yes, absolutely. We need to go to the World Radio Conference this year with full spectrum authority. We need to lead at that conference and lead the world on these matters. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Symington, I want to thank you for your work highlighting the role of receivers in promoting more effective use of our limited spectrum. I also appreciate your support for my Spectrum Coexistence Act, which will require the federal government to take a close look at its existing receiver technology. Commissioner Symington, briefly, what is the role of receivers in promoting more efficient spectrum use, and do you think it's valuable for the government to scrutinize its own technology? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, and uh, greatly appreciate, um, uh, I'm sorry, Ranking Member Matsu, and greatly appreciate your, um, your comments. So the roles of, uh, role of, um, of receivers in Spectrum is, uh, you know, it, is that there's a two-way transmission path. You transmit and you receive, and therefore the quality of receivers has a great bearing on what can be transmitted and what can be transmitted adjacently. Um, therefore, in planning spectrum, everyone takes receiver anticipated receiver quality and performance into account implicitly. The, the danger is, um, and the reason that the FCC has been reluctant to touch this issue before, is that the federal government could uh, impose overly rigid standards or uh, perhaps, in, uh, perhaps deviate from the harmful interference standard that's long established as uh, not only our law, but also um, as the international approach in favor of an engineering standard that would then become precedential and inappropriate and would serve as a straitjacket uh, to lock us into a particular developmental pathway. Okay, thank you. Um, today, I want to talk about robocalls. <laughs> today, Chair Chairman Lujan and I introduced the FCC Legal Enforcement Act to give the SCC new authority to go after scammers. Consumers across the country are inundated with these calls, and I believe it's imperative we help enforce, enforcers keep up with these fly-by-night operations. Chair Rosenwarzer, can you talk about the limitations of the existing process and how this bill will help the FCC crack down on scammers? Thank you for your efforts. We have been working to try to get rid of these junk calls and texts on overtime. In fact, like I mentioned, we have 44 state attorneys general now working with us on that. We've issued more than $700 million in fines, but the FCC is not institutionally allowed to go collect those fines in court. I'd like to have the power to do so. I recognize that some of these folks are fly-by-night companies, but I want to be able to hold them accountable in a court of law, so I appreciate your legislative efforts. Well, thank you very much, and I hope we can get rid of those robocalls, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, the chair of the full committee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, a, a question to each of you. I'll start with the chair. H.R. 3565, the Spectrum Auction Reauthorization Act of 2023, would restore FCC's general auction authority, fund the shortfall in the rip and replace program, and lead to improve processes for making spectrum available for commercial use. Do you support the legislation? Absolutely. Sure. Yes, it's vital that we restore uh, auction authority. The legislation does that, and I want to thank you for the leadership in doing that. Yes, thank you for the leadership as well. I strongly support the restoration of the FCC's auction authority development uh, of a spectrum pipeline. I think it's vital for security. Thank you. I'm very pleased the House has prioritized the reauthorization of uh, the FCC's auction authority, and I hope a comprehensive bill moves forward quickly through both houses of Congress. I believe nothing is more important than ensuring the FCC's auction authority is reinstated expeditiously and that a robust spectrum pipeline plan is secured in order to preserve U.S. technology leadership. Thank you. Uh, to the chair, just, just a few months ago, the commission officially stood up the Space Bureau and voted its first item on the satellite communications licensing 
While I was disappointed that the announcement came as a surprise, I'm glad that we have a shared goal of ensuring that the FCC processes satellite licenses effectively and efficiently. I appreciate your support of our legislation, the SAT Streamlining Act, which would provide direction to the FCC's Space Bureau to establish a streamlined statutory framework for the FCC to license satellite communications. How does the new Space Bureau advance the goal of making the United States an international leader on satellite spectrum policy? Well, I appreciate the priority you've brought to this issue here at the committee, and I want to make clear that we share it at the agency. We reorganized to set up a Space Bureau because we have so many more satellite applications before us, and the United States is in a position to lead, but we're going to have to process them more rapidly and more thoughtfully. We've already done work on orbital debris. We've done work to change the processing rounds for satellites in low Earth orbit. And we are the first country in the world to start to contemplate the combination of terrestrial and satellite systems in a single network future. So I think we've launched with a lot of activity and energy, and we'll be happy to keep you apprised of our progress. Thank you. Senator Cruz and I sent you a, a letter, um, Madam Chair, in April requesting information related to the standard general application to acquire Tegna. In your response, you declined to answer most of our questions. Since the transition is no longer before the FCC to be litigated, I hope you can answer our questions today, this merger would have created the nation's largest minority-owned and woman-led broadcast company in the United States history. There were reports that you knew by delegating this to be to a, an administrative law judge that it was destined to fall apart. As the chair of the FCC, the commission has control over the transfer of broadcast licenses. So why was the hearing designation order issued by the Media Bureau and under delegated authority rather than through a full commission vote? To be clear, this is still a restricted proceeding, so there are some limitations, but I will try to answer your questions. Uh, the commission has lots of precedent for doing this at the bureau letter level. Be happy to share those cases with you. In addition, the parties to this transaction took the agency to court, not once, but twice, and alleged that we were not following the law. But the DC Circuit, in both cases, found that the FCC's efforts to send this to an administrative law judge fully complied with the Communications Act. This is a provision that's been in the law since the 1930s, and if, of course, this committee has difficulties with it, we would work with you to change it and adjust it. But to be clear, our efforts are in our process is held up in court on two separate occasions. I'd like to ask the other commissioners if you believe this ac acquisition should have received a full commission vote, beginning with Commissioner Carr. Yes, Chair Rogers, I mean, look, as you noted, this would have created the largest minority-owned, uh, female-led broadcasting group. We've tried at the FCC through lots of administrations to bolster uh, minority ownership in media, and here we would have gone from the single digits in terms of ownership by minorities of full power stations to into the teens for the first time ever. Uh, I think we deserve to give these parties an up or down vote on the merits after a year plus long review. It's a problem here, but also more broadly, I think it's a troubling signal to anybody looking to invest uh, in local journal journalism, which we need as a country, that at any point in time, a trap door could open up and they can't get to a decision on the merits. <clears throat> thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the transaction in full never came before me as a commissioner. I didn't have the opportunity to view the full record. Uh, but, uh, you know, as the chairwoman said, twice this came before on the question of process and the law and our, um, uh, how we handled the transaction was upheld by the D.C. Circuit. Okay. Commissioner Simonton. I'm not going to disagree with uh, the characterization of the process as uh, following the law as, as currently written. On the other hand, I don't know that this addresses the concerns that you've raised. Um, uh, with uh, with the with the the adequacy of that process and with the confidence that we can have that this process will result in um, in full commission review going forward. So as I stated in my open uh, opening remarks, I I think it would be useful for the FCC to adopt or for Congress to s propose to the FCC a um, means of ensuring that every such uh, transaction is able to receive timely review at the commission level. Thank you, thank you, and my time has expired. I think bottom line. I want to reinforce the importance of the full commission doing, fulfilling your responsibilities versus being delegated to the Media Bureau. But more to come. I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman Latta. I think we would all agree that robocalls are pervasive and can be dangerous, and I, I authored the, um, the TRACE Act to impose common sense restrictions on these calls, and I recently announced that I'll be introducing legislation to, in part, to fix loopholes caused by the Supreme Court that allowed these calls to continue, unfortunately. So let me ask Chairwoman Rosenworcel about um, you know, what we can do about robocalls. What additional tools can Congress give the FCC to combat abusive robocalls? Thank you for your work on this. Unfortunately, the scam artists behind these calls are nimble, so we're gonna have to change our practices and change our approach fairly regularly. Two things I think would make a difference. The first, as I mentioned to Congresswoman Matsui, is making sure we have the authority to go to court and collect these fines. And the second thing is something I know that you've talked about, which is correcting a loophole that was created by the Supreme Court in the year before last, where they froze the definition of auto dialer in 1991 so that many of the scam artists can use equipment that get outside of the purview of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. I'd like to fix that so we can go after more of these bad actors, and it's my understanding you're willing to introduce legislation to do so, so we'd be happy to help. Thank you. Now, I welcome recent actions to refocus the agency on consumer privacy and data security. This committee has, on a bipartisan basis, been working aggressively to enact a privacy bill, but in the absence of a national standard, it's important that agencies like the FCC are stepping up to protect consumers' data. The committee is also currently investigating the shady world of data brokers, and I repeatedly pushed then-Chairman Pai to act in 2019 after reports exposed the sale of extremely sensitive wireless location data to bad actors like bounty hunters. The um, FCC existing rules prevent the sale of this data in most situations, and I was encouraged when the commission finally took bipartisan action, yet I'm troubled that efforts to finalize these enforcement actions have remained pending for nearly a year. So can I ask each of you, beginning with the chairwoman, um, and just say yes or no, have you voted to approve the pending forfeiture orders? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Uh, I have been discussing with my colleagues some ideas for paths forward in those. So for instance, the sale of this sensitive data continues. It has shifted from the carriers over to sort of other third parties. And my focus is how do we use this enforcement proceeding to potentially get at that ongoing conduct? And so that's what I've sort of put forward, and I would welcome the chance to, to do that in these enforcement items, and I'd be happy to move quickly on it. So then you haven't voted to approve the pending forfeiture orders? Right, I'm hoping we can move forward in a way that addresses okay. a broader problem. I know, I, I'm just on. trying to get through this. So let me go to uh, Commissioner Starks. Yeah, yes, I have voted the items. And Commissioner, um, I can't even read, oh, Symington, I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, like Commissioner Carr, I remain uh, troubled by the movement of the data brokers into GPS pings instead of CPNI, and I have not yet voted on these items. Okay, thank you. And let me go back to the chairwoman. Can you talk more about the sensitivity of precise location data and why it's so important for the commission to confirm these orders as soon as possible? Yeah, our geolocation data is a record of who we are. It's where we go and everything we do. And at the FCC, we have the gold standard. We tell carriers they cannot sell that data to anyone. That was a policy adopted during the last administration. And to the carriers who violated it, I just want to be able to hold them to account. That's why I'd, I'd appreciate my colleagues voting on the enforcement action that I've put before them. All right. Last question. During Superstorm Sandy, I saw the consequences of a total breakdown of communication networks, and I've worked to make sure people can stay connected when it matters the most. So the FCC recently mandated the wireless resiliency framework that I helped create, and this is going to make a difference and save lives. So let me just ask the Chairwoman, can you provide me with a status update on that effort? Yes, uh, appreciate the work you did following Superstorm Sandy. You set up a template for the commission and carriers to develop a voluntary framework to help restore communications after disaster. Following Hurricane Ida, Commissioner Carr and I went down to Louisiana, spent time with public safety there, and concluded that that framework could no longer be voluntary, it needed to be mandatory. It's now in place, and we are gonna keep tabs on it to make sure it works. We will have no shortage of hurricanes and storms and wildfires in which we do show, but it's really important that we keep up to date with these policies and make sure that every carrier works together to sustain communications in a disaster. 
Thank you. I was going to ask Commissioner Carr to comment, but my time is out. So thank you, Chairman. Thank the gentleman. And now I recognize the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Rockus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it, and I appreciate all your uh, testimony here. Uh, Chairwoman, uh, just like with the FTC oversight hearing, I've been anxiously waiting for the FCC's return to the Hill for its due oversight hearing. Uh, and right before the agency is set to testify, it magically starts to respond to congressional letters. Imagine that. Announce grant awards, and in this case, break news on the establishment of a new privacy task force. Over the past few years, considerable time and effort on the Innovation Data and Commerce Subcommittee, of which I chair, has been occurring on a bipartisan data privacy bill. So we're working on that. I expect you are familiar with previous versions, of course, of the efforts, which include having the FTC regulate common characters collection, use, and transfer of uh, consumer information as opposed to the FCC. So the question is, uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, should our takeaway on your privacy task force be that the FCC wants to regulate on top of what the FTC regulates on data privacy protections? Consumers care deeply about communications privacy. That's why Congress provided the FCC with authority to address communications privacy in Section 222 of the law, Section 631 of the law, and Section 337 of the law. We are using those provisions to help protect consumer privacy right now. We're not waiting for new laws. We're going to use them as much as we can to protect consumers as much as we can. The bottom line is that we have data breach laws that need to be updated in the communications sector. We have SIM swapping fraud we need to get on top of. And we have the enforcement of geolocation fines that needs to take place. I don't think we should apologize for using the law as we have it before us and protecting consumers' privacy. Well, you know, I, I know you just uh, stated and you cited some uh, sections, statutes. Again, uh, elaborate a little. Can you? Uh, which sections of the statutes you rely on to provide with the authority to regulate uh, data privacy? I know you just you just stated that, but uh, customer pro proprietary network information and customer network information is regulated under Section 222 of the law. There are comparable provisions for cable services and satellite services and other sections of the law. These have been in the place for decades. Okay. And I think it's incumbent on the agency to use them in a modern way. All right. That's I, what we're doing. Uh, next question. As you know, spectrum auction authority has expired. Leading up to that end date, no one truly knew how that expiration would impact the process of auctions that were completed, and winners were simply waiting for the issuance of licenses. Now we know the commission has taken a limited view on these license issuing authorities. Given that the hurricane season has begun, I'm most concerned about the ins ensuring that we can have resilient connections and have the ability to get networks back online as quickly as possible if they go down during a natural disaster. And as you know, the hurricanes affect my state of Florida, uh, and we have a lot of rural areas in my district. With auction authority having expired, why haven't you utilized temporary basis authorities for the use of the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, which would better allow for spectrum utilizations in the aftermath of a hurricane or other natural disaster. If you well, can answer that. I appreciate what you're saying about Florida following hurricanes Ian and Fiona. I went and spent time with public safety authorities in Florida and Lee County and talked to them about some of these issues. So I realize how important it is for restoration. But the FCC's authority to grant spectrum licenses expired. The law is super clear. It says, you shall have the authority to grant licenses, and it expires on March 9th. Any special temporary authority is subject to that broader authority. And so we are right now tying ourselves in knots trying to figure out how to get these licenses out. And the precedent we have here is complicated because issuing these licenses now could violate the Anti-Deficiency Act, which is a criminal statute. And just so you know, the last time that the FCC was alleged to have violated the Anti-Deficiency Act involving spectrum policy 
We had all sorts of staff in the agency get investigated by the GAO. They had to hire their own counsel. I don't want to have any of that nonsense happening again, but I would happily work with you and everyone else on this committee to do whatever we can to make sure we get that Spectrum Auction Authority back and definitely make sure we get it back before hurricane season gets fully underway. Well, please, I look forward to working with you. Please follow up. I'll, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Now I recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Clark. I thank the chairman and ranking member for holding this important oversight hearing and to our esteemed chairwoman and commissioners for participating today. The Federal Commission's, excuse me, the Federal Communications Commission's mission of promoting connectivity and ensuring a robust and competitive market is often challenged by the breakneck pace of technological innovation. That task is further complicated under a split commission by the rise of hyper-partisanship infecting our national discourse on topics once thought too mundane to draw the attention of politically motivated ideologues. In light of these challenges, I want to commend Chairwoman Rosenworcel and the entire commission for your hard work and success in these difficult times. It has not gone unnoticed. In addition to being a crucial component of unlocking much of the historic broadband investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law, the FCC's work to release its latest update to the national broadband map represents yet another significant step towards closing the digital divide and moving our nation towards a more equitable future. The upcoming disbursement of the Broadband Equity Adoption and Deployment BEAD program funds will undoubtedly serve to bring more Americans online and unleash innovation across the country. When we last hosted the commission for a hearing in March of last year, the Affordable Connectivity Program had already provided 10 million households assistance to afford broadband. And today, I'm proud to see that the ACP now supports over 18 million households, including nearly 1.4 million in New York City, in New York State. Beyond actions to keep us connected, the commission has also done important work to keep Americans safe. From standing up the 988 suicide and crisis lifeline, examining internet routing vulnerabilities, administering rip and replace efforts, and adopting a first of its kind broadband consumer label, the work done by the FCC makes clear its commitment to public safety and national security. The commission has also been hard at work implementing critical legislation passed out of this committee last Congress, including the Martha Wright Reed Just and Reasonable Communications Act, which will be the focus of my first question. The Martha Reed, excuse me, the Martha Wright Reed Just and Reasonable Communications Act directs the FCC to ensure that charges for communication services at correctional facilities are just and reasonable. For incarcerated people and their families, this is a civil rights issue. And studies show that connectivity is so important for reducing recidivism rates and creating better post-release outcomes. Chairwoman, can you provide us an update on the implementation of the Martha Wright Reed Act and tell us how this legislation can allow the commission to more fully address the predatory rates and other challenges faced by incarcerated people and their loved ones? Thank you for the question and thank you for your work on this. For far too long, the rates that have been charged for phone calls from our prisons and jails have just been usurious. And the families that are forced to pay them, it's totally unfair and it means that they can't stay in touch with their loved ones. And as you suggested, that increases the risk of recidivism. The FCC for over a very long time, starting with the work of my former colleague, Mignon Clyburn, tried to address these rates, and we kept on getting our handiwork sent back to us by the courts. That's why the work in the Martha Wright Reed Act is so important. It gives us authority to oversee intrastate rates for the first time and advance communications. We started a rulemaking to do that, and it is my goal to be able to address this and fix this wrong by next summer, and we're working hard to do just that. Outstanding. As, as has been noted, programs such as the ACP and Emergency Connected Connectivity Fund which covers the cost of connected devices for students and school staff and have rightly been seen by many as a 
rousing success, bringing high-speed broadband access to millions, the ACP in particular has been a significant progress in closing the digital divide and garnered bipartisan praise. Just yesterday, eight Senate Republicans wrote to, the pres to President Biden to express support for keeping ACP funded. Uh, Chairwoman, as a vocal proponent of the ACP, can you please explain for this committee why continued sustainable support for the ACP should remain a priority for Congress? And what is the risk if we allow funding for the ACP to run out? And other commissioners, you can feel free to uh, respond as well. It's really clear that you don't have a fair shot in the 21st century if you don't have access to broadband at home. And as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure law, we've got lots of funds to help with the deployment in largely rural areas, but we're also going to need funds and efforts to address affordability. The ACP is the best program we have ever developed to do that, and we got to make sure it continues. Mr. Chairman, I, had, uh, I will yield back and ask uh, the other commissioners, if you have any comments, please uh, respond to us in writing. I thank the gentlelady. And I recognize myself for questioning. I also want to thank the FCC for having the commissioners here together. Thank you for your help recently with Michigan uh, with our broadband maps. Uh, the agency's prompt response, and it was prompt, helped the state uncover and fix some discrepancies uh, that could have lost us hundreds of millions of dollars for broadband deployment, so thank you. The maps still have a ways to go, as you've said, always improving, uh, Madam Chair. But I'm confident that with improved coordination and planning, we can get rural Michigan and other places connected. Commissioner Carr, good to see you here. Hope you've just gotten down from a 2,000-foot tower or something that you're known to climb. Not certain why, but glad you take your job seriously. Um, on the note of Michigan being connected and others rural connections, how would a national broadband strategy like the one created by my plan for Broadband Act improve outcomes for rural deployment? Yeah, I think your legislation is incredibly important. Uh, it's good to see you. I enjoyed the, the visit we did a, a year or so ago uh, in your district. And I think what your legislation tackles is this current challenge of, for the first time, in a lot of ways, we have enough funding to end the digital divide. The question is, do we have the right policies and are we coordinated correctly to actually get it done? And with this GAO report that showed that we have, you know, broadband uh, spending over 130 different initiatives, 15 different agencies. We need a national coordinating strategy, and that's the exact piece that your bill would put in place. I think it's vital that we get that done. Well, we'll work at it. From your lips to our chairman's ears. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Carr, this committee has been working diligently to address the per pervasive threat of TikTok, especially after discovering that their CEO lied throughout his testimony here in March. I've heard some people make First Amendment arguments for why we shouldn't ban TikTok in the United States. Can you give us your perspective on the issue? I've heard that argument as well, and I don't think uh, that it's particularly strong. If you look at the Supreme Court precedent, they've drawn a very clear distinction between regulatory action based on the content of speech as opposed to the conduct of an actor. There's a famous Supreme Court case, Arcara Books, it had to do with a bookstore that was engaged in criminal conduct out of the bookstore. The government shut down the bookstore because of that. The proprietor said, you can't shut down my bookstore. That's First Amendment protected activity. And the court was clear that the action had nothing to do with speech or content. It was based on conduct. So too here with TikTok. The action would not be based on the content of TikTok's speech or for that matter, anybody's speech. It would be based on the conduct that represents a clear national security threat. And for that reason, I think the First Amendment argument against taking action on TikTok is not particularly strong. I appreciate the perspective. Madam Chair, um, turning to Spectrum, uh, the FCC recently sought comment on expanding the commercial use of the upper 12 gigahertz band. Um, what steps is the FCC taking to coordinate with NTIA to ensure that any federal agencies that may have concerns register those concerns in a timely manner versus after any potential future auction takes place? Uh, we are working very closely with NTIA on this issue right now. As you know, we have a spectrum coordination initiative with them, and it is designed to prevent there from being any late-breaking difficulties with existing federal incumbents. And as a result, uh, I think we are in the clear for this, but I'm looking forward to the record that develops. We just started a rulemaking on this subject. Oh. We look forward to it as well. 
in as timely a way as all of you are addressing our questions today. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and Commissioner Carr, how is the FCC approaching AI and how can it be used in the telecommunications networks? Thank simple, you. simple subject. Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, I will try to give you my 30 second response. Um, if I can for a minute, I wanna be an AI contrarian because I think it can do tremendous things for communications. That if we introduce machine learning and pattern recognition on our wired and wireless networks, we're going to be able to radically increase our efficiency. We'll take what feels scarce and make it abundant. And I just announced yesterday that we'll be working with the National Science Foundation to hold a forum to discuss just that. So I am not discussing AI writ large. I realize that's before a lot of other actors. But with respect to communications, I think it is full of potential. And I want to start to understand its use and start to incorporate it into our thinking about 5G and 6G networks and fiber facilities. That is the creative tension, isn't it? Uh, Commissioner Carr. You know, I'd say if you look back at the last few decades, there's been really two technology developments that have stood out, the internet and mobile, and I think AI is poised to be the third. That's how significant it's going to be. We want to encourage it, promote it. We don't want to smother it in the cradle, but we need to make sure that going forward, uh, it advances in a way that is consistent and promotes our values. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back and now recognize uh, Rep Representative Fletcher for her time of questioning. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Chairman Latta and Ranking Member Matsui for convening today's hearing to discuss the many important topics under the FCC's jurisdiction, and thank you uh, to Chairwoman Rosenmorsel and the commissioners um, for being here and answering these questions today. This has been a very useful hearing so far, and, um, and I really want to continue uh, on some of the topics that we've touched on and that we've touched on in our prior hearings um, in the last committee hearing we had last week, I talked about the importance of uh, reliable emergency communications for all of the diverse communities in my district. And I really wanna continue that conversation with you all today because I think it's critically important. Um, there are more than 140 languages spoken in my district and in the Houston um, area in Harris and Fort Bend counties. Um, in one neighborhood in my district alone, the Gulfton neighborhood, there are more than 50 languages spoken. Um, and unfortunately, last month, there was a critical uh, incident. There was a shelter in place issued uh, in our district. And unfortunately, many of the members of the community couldn't, uh, didn't get the emergency alerts, didn't get, um, didn't even know about this chemical fire uh, in the area um, or know to shelter in place because the wireless emergency alerts in the city of Houston's um, subscription-based alert system are available only in English and Spanish. Um, I know uh, and was very pleased to see that the FCC has adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking in April and is engaged in that process uh, to require wireless providers to translate alerts into the 13 most commonly spoken languages in the United States. Um, and Chairman Rosenworcel, I know and understand that as part of the, this notice that you sent letters um, to the nine largest providers of WEAs requesting information on how alerts can offer more multilingual access. And of course, we have visited um, about how you're looking to those who have done it successfully um, to figure out how we can implement effective programs. So can you share some of the information you've learned, some of the challenges that you see that are out there, and some of the ways that we on this committee and in the Congress can help uh, give you the tools you need to address this critical issue? Sure, wireless emergency alerts have extraordinary potential. All of us have those devices in our palm, our pocket, or purse at any time. So when they buzz with emergency information, we can act on it. Right now they're sent out in English and Spanish. But as you mentioned, there are a lot of people who might not get the information they need because it's not in a language they understand. So we've done a few things. As you mentioned, I've written to the largest wireless providers and asked about this technology and what changes might need to be made. I reached out to the New York Attorney General who's been working with us because the New York Emergency Management Department actually has some protocols to get it out in 13 languages. And then we started a rulemaking. So my hope is we're gonna get a robust record and we're gonna figure out how to move forward, make these available to more people in more languages. But over time, we might also need assistance from you because FEMA runs the integrated uh, system that helps send out these messages and I wanna make sure we're all working and rowing in the same direction. Um, thank you. I, you know, in um, it, it, 
one of the issues that that raises, you mentioned FEMA, and I know that uh, one of the challenges that you noted in response to the letter we sent back in February is that there are more than 1,600 federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments that are responsible for these alerts as well in, in coordination with and, and at times working um, at times working with FEMA, at times obviously working on their own, um, and that these generally are, are usually just in English and Spanish. Um, I know that you have provided guidance to these entities um, in sending non-English and non-Spanish alerts, um, but I'm wondering, again, sort of what we can do that's helpful and whether the FCC has the authority it needs to address um, the alerts through the rulemaking, whether there are additional authorities that you need or what the things, um, what things Congress can do really to help also support these entities and ensure that they have the resources to send out the alerts in languages other than English and Spanish uh, to those who need it? Those are all the right questions. They're the ones that we've asked in our rulemaking. And as soon as we get comments in, I'd be happy to make sure that my staff sits down with yours and identifies uh, pathways forward and what might take additional congressional action. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for that. I appreciate your work on this issue um, and just want to stress that it's of great importance uh, to me and my communities, I know as it is to my colleagues um, here on this committee. So um, because I typically uh, run overtime, I'm going to yield back with some time left. I thank you. Uh, Y'all have covered my other questions I had prepared. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the vice chair of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Georgia, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for hosting this committee, Mr. Chairman. This is extremely, um, this hearing, this is extremely important. And thank all of you commissioners for being there, for being here today. Commissioner Carr, I would be remiss if I did not thank you again for coming to my district a couple of years ago. and 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 seeing firsthand the struggles that we have in South Georgia and rural areas and the need for, for more broadband and high-speed internet in, in, our, in, our, in our district and in South Georgia in general. So thank you again. Um, since I've been on this committee, one of my top priorities has been closing the digital divide, particularly in the rural areas. I know I've said it numerous times before, and you've probably heard it, but there are two Georgias. There's Atlanta and everywhere else, and I represent everywhere else. And that's a struggle sometimes for us, particularly when it comes to broadband. Chairwoman Rosen Warchel, I wanted to ask you, last May, the FCC proposed rules for an enhanced ACAM program that would have increased um, speed requirements for participants. And I, I actually wrote a letter to, to you asking you to take action and very pleased that um, the, I see the announcement last Friday that, that you're moving forward with this proposal on circulation. Can you, can you describe the proposal for me, please? Sure. Uh, the rural carriers in this country who serve communities like those in South Georgia have long depended on the FCC's Universal Service Fund. Some of those carriers depend on a model to get financial support. Others depend on a legacy system. But those systems were going to be coming to an end in a few years, and they had less uh, than robust standards for the speeds that needed to be delivered. So what we've done is we've updated the speeds and we've extended the time period for support. I've put that before my colleagues, um, and it's complex, but I think it's a good model and a good way forward to continue to support rural carriers providing broadband. Well, thank you, and thank you for addressing the, the issue of rural carriers and the issue of, uh, uh, of the rural areas. really do appreciate that. Let me ask you, um, last year when you testified before the subcommittee, you stated that, and I quote, we should make sure that when we are developing programs for federal funds, we condition those funds on having a reasonable and streamlined process for things like permitting and right of ways. Do you still agree with that statement? Um, yes. Okay. Are you familiar with the with the American Broadband Development Act that I proposed and that streamlines the permitting process at the federal, state, and the local levels, and just wondering if you're in support of that. A little bit. If I look at what has come before the agency, I will tell you this, that I think our biggest permitting problem now is on federal lands. Uncle Sam owns about one-third of the real estate of this country, and the standards for response back to those who want to build on those uh, lands we, um, we allow federal actors to take a lot more time before they get back to someone who wants to build than we do state and local entities. Mm -hmm. At this point, I think we got to focus on that because I think that is a huge gap in our system, and it's where I would focus efforts were I to sit in your shoes. Right, right. And 
we certainly have federal lands in South Georgia as well, so that, that's of concern to us. One last thing, um, Chairwoman, on April 24th, the FCC granted several waivers sought by auto manufacturers to use the 5.9 gigahertz band for cellular vehicle to everything, I believe it's called CV2X technology, so that they can immediately deploy the technology. However, some parties like Georgia uh, didn't receive a waiver to begin this deployment. What, when can we expect the FCC to take action on the remaining waiver request to ensure that the spectrum can be used by entities like Georgia who have requested a waiver? Sure, this makes uh, clear that uh, new cellular uh, technologies can be used by auto manufacturers in the upper 30 uh, megahertz of the 5.9 gigahertz band. We have given a waiver to some actors we are adjusting that waiver because there's been some technical concerns about power levels. Once we get that just right, we're going to be able to move on to the rest of them. We're working with our colleagues at NTIA to do so. Great, great. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you all. Well, I appreciate it. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California's 29th district for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member, for having this important uh, committee hearing, and also to Chairwoman and, and FCC Commissioners as well. Thank you so much for your time and, and your expertise today. One of Congress's core responsibilities is oversight. Hearings like the one today allows us to monitor the progress being made to address the challenges America is facing in the broadband access, media ownership, spectrum allocation, the time it takes to participate in spectrum auction, and the actual assignment of those, that spectrum and many, many other matters. One issue of particular interest to me is the implementation and expansion of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Since it was launched in July of last year, millions of Americans have been connected to trained counselors in a time of crisis. Last month alone, more than 400,000 contacts were routed to trained professionals with an average answer time of 35 seconds. There is no doubt in my mind this program has saved lives, but we must continue to work systematically to build out the, and improve this life-saving program. For example, right now calls, texts, and chats sent to 988 are connected to crisis centers based on the area code of the caller. This sometimes routes people in crisis to centers thousands of miles from their physical current location and potentially jeopardizes their ability to access the nearest and best care. Uh, Chairwoman, in your opinion, what obstacles remain before the FCC can guarantee phone calls, text messages, and chats sent to 988 are routed to the participating crisis center closest to the geographic area from where the call, the message, or the chat is originated from? Thank you for the question. And as you mentioned, in the nearly year since 988 has been available, it's become a tremendous resource for anybody who is... Um, contemplating suicide or suffering from a mental health crisis. We got it up and running using the area codes. So an area code from Washington, D.C. will go to someone who can respond in Washington, D.C. without regard to where the person is. Now, over time, we want to be able to make those um, connections more local and more effective. But we want to be very careful when we do this because there are privacy and confidentiality reasons to be careful here. And so what we did is we held a forum with uh, carriers to try to discuss geolocation last year, and we are now working with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration to try to make sure that they're talking to the carriers as well. It's my hope we're gonna have an announcement or a pilot, try to find a way forward, so that wherever you are, when you reach out for help, we can send resources to you, because who you'll be talking to will be somebody who is nearby. So, um, to clarify to the people listening, the technical answer to that is within reach. So I it's think, not like yeah. we have a problem with the technical aspect. We just have to make sure we do it in a way that respects all the tangibles that, in order to do it right, safely, and protecting people's privacy. Exactly. I don't want us to just solve this as a technical matter. I want the mental health authorities to sit with us and help us manage privacy and safety and security every step of the way. Oh, as it should be. Thank you very much, Chairwoman. Um, an area of importance to me and uh, my constituents is the con continuity affordable connectivity program. I want to address some of the comments that have been made here today because I think there's some misunderstanding about the purpose of the program. 
Commissioner uh, Symington, you wrote in your testimony that we should consider, quote, more precise targeting of the program to those who it was designated to serve, end quote. This seems like a strange suggestion to me because Congress, on a bipartisan basis, set out clear eligibility criteria in the law. That is who the program was designed to serve. The suggestion that this program should be narrowed to only those who would not otherwise have broadband seems to me to ignore the reality of family budgets and the sacrifices many families often need to make to afford necessities that so many of us take for granted. The fact remains that for far too many American households in both Democratic and Republican districts, the monthly cost of an, an internet connection is not affordable enough to them. So my question to you, Chairwoman rosen is it in, in your events raising awareness of this program, I'm sure you have met many families in rural, urban, and suburban areas and on tribal lands benefiting from ACP. Can you describe for us how this program serves those families and their communities and why it would be so short-sighted to help only people who have never been online? I agree. Uh, there's a study out there that shows that households that earn $50,000 or less, half of them are at regular risk, month-to-month -month risk of wow. being disconnected from the internet. That means they won't have a shot at success in modern life. We need to make sure the Affordable Connectivity Program speaks to those families as well as those who have never been online. Okay, thank you very much. My ha time having expired, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired and yields it back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's second district for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the FCC has certainly become well-known to Americans due to its uh, roles in TV, uh, radio, cable, now space as well. Uh, commercial, academic, and military use of space-based architecture has seen unprecedented growth in the last couple of decades. And therefore, it's essential that the FCC also move at the speed of business. I was very pleased to see the creation of the Space Bureau, the FCC, this April. Uh, this is designed to handle all matters relating to satellite and spectrum approval, orbital launch, communications, and preventing debris, space debris. And that's a great start. It's exciting to see the Commission focus on improving the processes for using space, unleashing American commercial space innovation is critical to our global competitiveness, including our competition with China. When it comes to winning the race to 5G and the benefits of next generation networks, I fear we are falling behind on securing a licensed spectrum pipeline to, uh, to compete on the global stage, particularly against China. Chinese operators already have more access to mid-band spectrum than US operators. And the CCP is expanding aggressively. It has been estimated they may soon have four times as much commercial license mid-band as US. Uh, it's concerning if China can efficiently deploy their 5G architecture and develop software that rides on top of these next-gen networks. And I, I worry that our rivals will leverage that innovation against us in all sectors. In December of 21, the FCC acknowledged the growth of the space economy and noted a swath of new satellite applications. They committed to improving their satellite review processes. And while the creation of Space Bureau and an MOU between it and the NTIA look to be very positive, there, I think some challenges remain. I think you noted, actually, Madam Chair, at the end of 22, roughly 64,000 satellite applications were pending FCC approval. Uh, Madam Chair, by the end of this calendar year, 23, how do you think that will look and, and uh, what, what are we going to do to expedite the review of these applications? Well, when I got to the agency, the first thing I did was take a look and say, where do we have a volume of work and we don't have the people to address it? And what became apparent to me is that when it comes to satellites, the United States is in a position of leadership. We are launching more into our skies than any other country. But at the same time, we're gonna to have to update our practices for reviewing those satellites and reviewing those constellations. That's why we started the Space Bureau. That's exactly what's going on now. That's why we started a proceeding to streamline our assessment of those applications. And it's why we're looking into the far future and thinking about how terrestrial and satellite networks will combine so that we can get rid of mobile dead zones and we can do new and creative things with combined 
access to satellite and ground-based systems. Well, th thank you for that. Additionally, the FCC's December press release mentioned the commission would consider quickly issuing public notices on applications from U.S. companies when filing at the FCC. However, these companies are telling me they still have uh, applications that sit with the commission for extended periods of time before action is taken. In fact, some have noted that their uh, applications were filed months ago, but they haven't been published for even even for as much as a public comment at this point. Can you can you identify the current FCC process that is a bottleneck to contributing to this delay? Yeah, I think historically the agency has had this practice of making sure every duck is in a row, every piece of paper is filed, everything is before us before we put these applications on public notice. When I came in, I decided that that process takes too long and is insufficiently transparent. So we started a rulemaking to identify how to say exactly what needs to be filed so that we can put all of those applications on public notice more expeditiously and then resolve the application faster. So we have an outstanding rulemaking on just what you're describing, and I think we're gonna be able to make progress. I have to believe that these companies are pretty talented, and if you give them clear instructions that they can, they can follow clear instructions, and uh, please, please work with us here to help you in any way that we can. We want that process to speed up. We want it to be good, but we want it to speed up. Commissioner Carr, in the remaining few seconds, do you, do you agree that the United States needs uh, to secure a meaningful pipeline of licensed spectrum for 5G to keep pace with consumer data usage and importantly to compete with the CCP? Yeah, thank you, Congressman. I agree. It's vital both for <clears throat> efforts to bridge the digital divide here, but moving spectrum forward, getting action on that is vital to our geopolitical interests. For one example, we talked about this world radio conference that's coming up. Uh, Communist China and other unallied nations are engaged in constant mini battles in that setting to develop services and particular spectrum bands that are consistent with their interests and their values, and we're trying to push back. When we have a big pipeline of spectrum, when we have auction authority, it puts the wind at the back of those that are negotiating for U.S. and our interests. So spectrum authority and spectrum action is vital to our geopolitical interests and security. Well, Congress will help you in any way we can with that. So it's a very important effort. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New Hampshire for five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to start today by recognizing the chairwoman for her attention and urgency to implement the Safe Connections Act. Last Congress, I led this legislation with my colleagues, Representative Eshoo and Wahlberg, to require phone companies to allow survivors of domestic violence to quickly separate their phone lines from shared plans with an abuser. A cell phone is a critical lifeline, enabling survivors to stay connected to support networks and to access assistance from hotlines or emergency services. As the founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Task Force to End Sexual Violence, I was proud to see this legislation signed into law to protect this lifeline for survivors. Chair Rosenworcel, can you share any updates on your agency's work to implement this law? Thank you so much for your work on this law, along with Congresswoman Eshoo and Congressman Wahlberg. It's really important. One in four women in this country will face domestic violence, one in nine men. And so before we even put pen to paper, what I did at the FCC was talk to experts in domestic violence. Because what I learned was the minute that somebody decides to get a new phone is the minute they decide to leave their abuser. It's really important. And that means the FCC has a really valuable role to play, and you gave us tools to do that in the Safe Connections Act. So we are working right now to identify what policies need to be put in place to make sure that someone can get out of their family plan fast, securely, and privately. Also putting policies in place to make sure that that individual can sign up for Lifeline or the Affordable Connectivity Program, and making sure that call logs do not reference domestic violence support systems so that people can call them safely and securely. Along the way, we've worked with the carriers that take all those calls and made sure that they're working with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Because if somebody calls and wants to get off their family plan because they are leaving a domestic abuse situation, we want to make sure they don't get any old person who's answering the phone at the call center. We're going to make sure those individuals are actually trained to deal with this situation and can provide additional help and support. So you've put in place a very good thing, and I am confident that by next summer we're going to be able to act on it and have rules in place. 
Great, thank you. This program will take needed steps to eliminate barriers for survivors and provide support as they rebuild their lives. Now, the Safe Connections Act also includes a provision to assist survivors who may be facing financial hardship and are unable to afford their phone plan, as you referenced. I understand the FCC is currently considering whether to dedicate the Affordable Connectivity Program to provide emergency communication support to survivors who have separated their phone plans. Unfortunately, as you know, the ACP is expected to exhaust its funding sometime next year. <clears throat> Chair Rosenworcel, if Congress were to fail to authorize renewed funding for the Affordable Connectivity Program, how could this affect survivors under the Safe Connections Act? If Congress were to fail to appropriate new funds for the Affordable Connectivity Program, we would undermine the biggest broadband affordability program this nation has ever created it. We would cut families off, and we would also cut off survivors who rely on this program to stay connected and rebuild their lives. Great, thank you very much. The ACP is already serving as a lifeline to the more than 18 million households that currently rely on this program to remain connected. In New Hampshire, over 30,000 households, including nearly 17,000 in my district, have signed up for the ACP and more households are signing up every day. As co-chair of the Rural Broadband Caucus, I understand that addressing affordability is a crucial step toward closing the digital divide for rural households. Congress has already invested over $42 billion through the BEAD program to build broadband infrastructure in unserved and underserved communities. This is a once in a generation investment in our nation's broadband infrastructure, but this investment will be wasted if Americans can't afford to pay for broadband services. The ACP helps to bridge this affordability gap. Now, I've also seen studies that estimate that the ACP can reduce the cost of broadband infrastructure in rural areas by up to 25% per household. That's not an insignificant cost savings. If we want federal dollars to go further in reaching our shared goal of closing the digital divide, we cannot let the ACP lapse just as the BEAD program is set to begin. Chairman Rosenworcel, would you agree? I agree. I think the ACP program and the BEAD program work hand in glove. They work together. One attacks deployment, the other attacks subscribership. By working together, we're going to solve our digital divide. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate your leadership of the agency, and I yield back. Chairman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Matsui, for bringing together this hearing and to our FCC commissioners for giving your time to be here today. As we all know, access to broadband has become a critical need, not just a want. The lack of broadband access has hit hard, particularly in my district in Pennsylvania 13, as our rural residents and farmers face increasingly unmanageable digital divide. We need to ensure that all Americans are able to connect to the internet, regardless of what town or what community or what geographic divides are presented to them. Chairwoman Rosenworcel, NTIA was given $42.45 billion for broadband equity access and development, the BEAD program, which is aimed to give grants to communities to build broadband networks, specifically in unserved areas. Would you please discuss how your agency is working with NTIA to ensure that this program is successful in the rural areas that I serve? Absolutely. Like you mentioned, we're making a historic commitment to closing the digital divide in this country. $42 billion to make sure networks reach rural communities is a big deal. We've got to make sure it's spent in the right places. That's why we've developed our nation's broadband map, which is the most granular accounting of where service is and is not in our nation's history. And quite literally, every day we are on the phone and working with NTIA to make sure they understand that map understand its nuances, understand the trends we're seeing, because we want all of our data to inform their allocation in the BEAD program. And to that point, the allocation date for BEAD funding is June 30th. It's right around the corner. Currently, my state of Pennsylvania still has around 5,000 challenges that were submitted by the initial January deadline that have yet to be adjudicated. Would you please describe how the FCC adjudicated these challenges submitted during 
the challenge process? And will you be able to adjudicate those remaining 5,000 Pennsylvania challenges prior to this upcoming June 30th deadline? So the most important thing to know is that we take in challenges every day, every month, every year. And then under the law, there are certain time periods in which we can resolve them. FCC rules give 60 days for a carrier to look at those challenges, 60 days to resolve them with the customer. And then Congress threw another 90 days on top of that in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So this is the time frame in which we resolve availability challenges. Now, that being said, every time we can resolve them earlier, we do so. And every time we resolve challenges, we update our map very, very shortly thereafter, and we call our colleagues at NTIA. With respect to what you're talking about in Pennsylvania, I'd be happy to have my team follow up with you offline so you know just where everything stands. Thank you. That process. June 30th deadline with those 5,000 continued adjudicated issues to be resolved, I thank you for that follow up. We know that the FCC's campaign to advertise the ACP has begun. We also know that the program will run out of funding early next year. Chairwoman Rosenworcel, is it responsible to do this before Congress decides the future of the program? Working with my colleagues on a bipartisan basis, we committed to doing more outreach with this program. That was also a recommendation from the GAO. So we set aside a small amount of money to do it, and then we followed federal contracting procedures and grant procedures to get those dollars out. We are putting a premium on everyone who's received funds, using them as soon as possible to make sure that there's no conflict with an appropriation or a coming appropriation from Congress. Commissioner Carr, I congratulate you for your boots on the ground approach as we look to roll out additional rural broadband. You are acutely aware of how the lack of internet access negatively affects rural American. Students and their learning have been left behind. Businesses suffer without access to expanding e-commerce. Farmers are unable to utilize precision agriculture to more effectively produce food for America. And patients and doctors cannot access the ability to heal from home with telemedicine. Commissioner Carr, do you feel that the FCC recognizes the impact of the digital divide on rural America and are all steps being taken to address this from the FCC perch? I do think so. I, I think we uh, fundamentally agree that we have to do more to end the digital divide. And we've done a lot, but there's more to be done on infrastructure. As I mentioned, I think there's a lot more we could do on sort of meat and potato infrastructure reforms. Again, we have all of these B dollars coming out the door, $42 billion. If we don't streamline permitting and we're just spending this additional money, we're effectively jumping on the gas and the brakes at the same time. So we need to address federal lands. That probably requires some congressional action. We need to take a look at uh, railroad crossings, which continue to be a big barrier to broadband bills. There's some legislation here that could do that. And I think we should take some of the shot clocks and um, uh, fee reforms that we apply to small cells and look at applying those to wired infrastructure. If we can do that at the FCC, which I think we can, um, we could accelerate these rural builds even faster. I see my time is expiring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks to all the witnesses for being here today, and I yield. Thank you, the chairman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California's 16th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our ranking member, Congresswoman Matsui. Welcome, uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and the uh, commissioners of the FCC. It's always great to uh, uh, see you and have you here <coughs> in this hearing room. Uh, I was, uh, as I was listening to uh, others, I was reminiscing over all of the FCCs that have come here during my tenure. Uh, <clears throat> and um, it's, a, it's a long and uh, important effort. Uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, uh, for as long as I can remember, uh, you have been, in my view, the leading voice about the need to close the digital divide and the homework gap. And I would argue, uh, that the uh, availability of uh, uh, mid-band spectrum uh, is an important tool to, um, uh, to achieve these goals. Now, uh, this last Sunday marked uh, 100 days uh, since the FCC Spectrum uh, Auction Authority expired. We all know that spectrum is the gold, 18 karat gold, not 12 or 14. 18 karat gold of the 21st century. Nothing moves without it. Uh, yet the commission is um, 
uh, sitting on a vast amount of mid-band spectrum in the 2.5 gigabert, uh, gigabert, uh, gigahertz band uh, spectrum that was won at auction. Uh, a carrier paid over $300 million for that last August. That's going to come up to a year pretty soon. And I don't know if that money is earning interest, uh, where it is. Uh, it's stunning to me that someone pays for something, they don't get it, but the person or the entity they paid it to still gets to, uh, uh, to keep it. Um, these licenses that, that haven't been issued, and more importantly, um, the real point is, is that they're not being put to use. Uh, we know that four uh, uh, FCC general counsels wrote to the FCC in March about this. <coughs> Public Knowledge wrote to uh, the uh, uh, commission uh, uh, in, in January to express their concerns over uh, the licenses. Um, in fact, uh, Public Knowledge is uh, uh, a part of uh, uh, Harold Feld's letter said, uh, I'll quote, as always, when licenses are at issue, this is not simply a matter that impacts a single company. Licenses are issued to serve the community of license. And the delay uh, in issuing these licenses denies um, those communities uh, all the important services uh, that come with them. Uh, public knowledge also uh, went on to ask the commission to issue a public notice to publicly state whether it has in fact concluded that it does not have the authority to issue the licenses at issue. They also went on to request um, the commission to consider alternatives, the STAs, uh, the Special Temporary Authority. I wrote to the commission, wrote to you in the commission, uh, I believe it was May 15th, uh, uh, stating essentially the same case. Uh, I know that um, uh, I wrote with um, uh, Congressman Soto uh, on, I believe it was June 16th. That's very recent, so you wouldn't have, I don't think, had a chance to answer. T-Mobile has written. Uh, uh, Public Knowledge has written. But there's no response on uh, STAs. And, uh, and no official statement uh, requiring the public to rely on reports, you know, in press and public statements and, and all of that. So I'm, um, you know that this has been a source of not only aggravation to me, but real worry. And I, I think writ large that it sets a chill in many ways on auctions that have been so uh, extraordinarily successful uh, over the last two years. So uh, I, I want to ask you, uh, Chairwoman, if you'll give consideration to the uh, STAs. So I want to make clear that this situation is totally unfair. I've said that to the CEO of the company involved. It's also unprecedented, because for 30 years we've had this authority. Congress you know, I, has always I know renewed it's, it. Uh, I know it's unprecedented. And yeah. So are the commission's well, actions or inactions. Let me also explain this. This is an area where the law is extremely clear. It says, our authority to issue licenses shall expire on March 9th. This is not ambiguous language. I only and have 17 seconds listen, left. Listen, special I, I temporary authority you, I only exists you, to the extent I, I that, that underlying authority is there. I if you will there. consider uh, 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 STAs and if you'll commit to providing the public transparency that's really due uh, because this is a huge issue. We are going to continue to look at every law that we can to see if there's a way forward here. My other concern is violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act. I don't hear you saying yes. Well, what we're doing right now is studying the laws to make sure we don't violate the Anti-Deficiency Act, which is a criminal law. And as I mentioned earlier today, the last time it was alleged that the FCC violated the Anti-Deficiency Act in a situation involving our spectrum authority, the GAO investigated, and the staff of the agency had to hire their own counsel to defend themselves. Like I said before, I don't want any of that nonsense. Well, That's why we're going to be expired. exceptionally careful. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, General Lady's time has expired. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, the 4th District, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 14th District, you kind of shorted me there. 
It's, it's I apologize. All, it's all good. Thank 14. you. <laughs> In April, the World Radio Communications Conference, WRC Advisory Committee, submitted its recommendations to the FCC, which it put out for public comment. But it's kind of unclear what has happened since. As the FCC prepares to work with the Department of State in preparation for the WRC, transparency is going to be the key to our private sector partners. So Chairwoman Rosenforce, in 30 seconds or less, <laughs> does the FCC adopt a view for each item, and is that something the chair decides, or does the commission vote on it? On our World Radio Conference recommendations? Mm -hmm. uh, it has generally been the practice that we work with industry to develop them, develop them through the World Radio Conference Advisory Committee, and then we work with other countries in our region to develop consensus proposals. Do you vote on whether to use to submit those as the commission? Or is that something you just decided? I have to go back and check, but I don't believe that that has been the practice of the agency. But I make clear to my colleagues where we're going before we head to the World Radio Conference. Do they make yeah. clear to you whether they agree? Well, I think we have a good relationship, and I expect them to provide me feedback okay. whenever they feel like I'm it. Just, I'm just checking. Okay. Commissioner Carr, I'm going to go to you. The United States is currently in the process of defining our wireless future by working to advance our spectrum policy interests at the WRC. Unfortunately, at the same time, we are advocating for certain spectrum bands to be made available. The FCC lacks the authority to conduct auctions, as we all are painfully aware. Or what was it the, chair, the woman from California said, aggravated and worried? Um, so, Commissioner Carr, do you think this undermines our credibility? I think having auction authority going into WRC is of vital importance. Again, we are having lots of little mini debates in that context, the CCP allied entities want certain spectrum bands be used for certain purposes. Mm -hmm. Our allied nations want it to go a different way. When we have auction authority can sit at that table, it's a wind at the back of our negotiators. So it is in the US's geopolitical interests to have spectrum authority and to be, uh, spectrum auction authority and be moving forward, moving spectrum bands out. You're gonna help us push that through the Senate? Happy to do it. Okay, I thought so far. So let me do a follow up. You mentioned earlier that we need to reinstate auction authority and pass H.R. 3565 to ensure that China doesn't write our wireless future. It's almost as if they're not our friends. How involved is the FCC in security assessments of foreign actors' motivations when engaging in global institutions such as the ITU for the U.S. and its allies to vacate or make certain bans available that countries like China will not permit at home. Did you catch all that? How involved is the FCC in security assessments, in security assessments of foreign actors' involvement when you're engaging with those global institutions, such as the ITU? Chairwoman, maybe we'll come to you. I see you writing, go ahead. Well, as a result of Congress passing laws like the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act and the Secure Equipment Act, we are now working with our national security authorities on these matters like never before. We have established relationships with them. We keep them abreast of how we're developing our recommendations and progress with the World Radio Conference. So you're confident those will be in place and America will get the best deal possible, the safest and the best? Yes, I am. Okay. Commissioner Carr, I'll come back to you. When the commission makes a spectrum decision, literally billions of dollars are spent by private industry, I think we've touched on this, um, to make the equipment and deploy the networks that bring the value of that decision to Americas in their homes and also on the move. But lately, some have been calling for the FCC to reverse its allocation decisions. So I'm concerned about the impact on investment if the, F if the FCC were to do an about face after they've already made up their mind. I'm concerned about the investment, what that will do to investors. Do you share that concern? You know, we certainly need to you know, provide certainty. And once we authorize and allocate spectrum, we have billions of dollars of investment. We should not be coming in behind after the fact and, and pulling the rug out from under. It's bad in that instance, and it's bad to attract the investment that we need to U.S. shores to continue to bridge the digital divide. Is there a time frame in there? In other words, you know, if you did it immediately, maybe not too bad. If you did it a year or two later, is the longer the time left, is the worst a, a, a retraction, so to speak, or reversal would be? Right, exactly. There's, there's longer uh, sort of uh, reasonable investment back uh, expectations the longer the FCC would wait before taking such an action. All right, well, I'm going to, time's up. I'm going to yield back, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Ladder and Ranking Member Matsui for holding this important hearing. And I've been in another committee, so excuse me for not being here um, for very long. Uh, I want to thank the commissioners for their testimony and all the work the FCC is doing to expand access to broadband infrastructure and lowering, lowering internet costs for Americans. For my constituents back home in Illinois, there is no dispute that expanding access to affordable high-speed internet services is one of the most beneficial things that can happen in a community. The impact of broadband expansion on economic outcomes is significant, resulting in improved life outcomes stemming from higher property values, increased job and population growth, and lowering unemployment rates. And my district is, as you know, urban, suburban, and rural. One such program helping to accomplish this is the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP. In Illinois, it is estimated that over 550,000 households are enrolled in this program, which saved Illinoisans $16.6 million on their internet service. In my district, the second congressional district, it is estimated there are about 61,000 enrollees in the program, saving my constituents about $1.8 million on their internet bills. These are real savings for real people. Chair Rosenworcel, I have seen studies that estimate the existence of ACP can reduce by 25% the per household subsidy needed to build in rural areas. In fact, multiple Republican senators wrote to President Biden just yesterday in support of additional ACP funding. If we want government to go further in reaching our shared goal of closing the digital divide, why is it important that Congress and this committee work to maintain funding for ACP? And when must the FCC begin preparing for the possibility that program, the program will run out of money or it will need funds? The Affordable Connectivity Program is a big deal. It's the largest broadband affordability program in our nation's history. And the thing is, if we're going to give out funds like we are in the BEAD program to help deployment in rural areas, we got to make sure that people are going to show up and subscribe. So these programs work hand in glove, the BEAD program and the ACP program. We need to make sure the ACP program continues so that the BEAD program can also thrive. We anticipate that the funds could end for this program as they've been appropriated so far by uh, as early as April of next year. So we got to start planning now and working with Congress now to make sure that this big historic program to help close the digital divide and keep everyone online and all the good it's doing can continue. Thank you for your response. I am chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and have done a lot of work around maternal mortality and uh, morbidity. So yesterday's announcement from the FCC on how the agency is exploring the role of broadband connectivity and maternal health outcomes could not have come at a better time. As we know, broadband connectivity also leads to improved health outcomes. Um, can you talk about the importance of this data to help this country take strides to improve maternal mortality rates? The U.S. is the only industrialized country with a rising level of maternal mortality. And for women who live in rural areas and black and Latino women, the numbers are even higher. It's unfair, it's not right, and we have got to fix it. So we're doing our part to contribute by looking at the data for broadband deployment and overlaying it with facts about maternal mortality. We know there are telemedicine and telemonitoring solutions for women in pregnancy, and we want to make sure that they're available. And so we're, our hope is that by pushing this data out, which is a combination of FCC data and data from the CDC and other places, we're going to get people to study it, to tell us what patterns there are out there, and what kind of telemedicine programs can help us address this crisis. Thank you. I am one of the co-chairs of the Data Mapping to Save Mom Moms Lives Act. Now, quickly turning to Spectrum. Uh, can you, uh, by letting auction authority lapse, is the U.S. at risk of losing our global leadership position with respect to technology and innovation? Unfortunately, yes. We're going to have to get that authority back because when we have Spectrum in the pipeline and we have auction authority, nobody innovates or creates like the U.S. when it comes to wireless services. And even with the current lack of auction authority, are the FCC and NTIA continuing to work with Government uses like DOD to identify new spectrum for deployment to ensure commercial access for 5G, 
IoT and other technologies. We continue to talk to NTIA about those matters on an almost daily basis. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia's 12th district for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. And I want to thank our uh, committee uh, witnesses for being here. Uh, it's been 15 months since this subcommittee last held an FCC oversight hearing. So we have lots to go over today, and I know a lot has been said so far. Commissioner Carr, it's been over three months since the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority expired. I have a lot of constituents uh, waiting to be provided 5G service with that 2.5 gigahertz spectrum band that you mentioned in your testimony. Can you explain what's going on with the licensing of the spectrum band? Yeah, actually, I think the, the FCC's authority to issue those 2.5 gigahertz licenses is clear. I think the statutory analysis is very straightforward. Our Section 309J authority to conduct new auctions has expired. Our Section 309A authority to issue licenses, including licenses won at previous auctions, has not expired. In fact, if you look at the FC decision to issue licenses won at auctions, we cite our 309A authority, which again is continuing, not our 309J authority. In fact, there's a very similar case, um, basically directly on point, a 2003 case, Ranger Cellular, where our uh, then lottery authority expired, including language that said shall issue, um, but our 309A authority continued in the FCC <coughs> issued those licenses. Our general counsel went to the DC circuit and said effectively it doesn't make any sense to read that the statute having to do with our uh, then lottery authority having expired prevented us from issuing licenses. And so this is why I think you saw four FCC general counsels uh, write a letter from various administrations saying that we can move forward with our uh, licensing of that spectrum. Um, I'm a former general counsel, so maybe there's five now that, that agree with that view. And if we did so, it would effectively light up uh, spectrum for 50 million Americans. And in many cases, this is spectrum and, and that the radios, the antennas are already up there. So the flip of a switch, we can bring 50 million Americans across the digital divide or get them better service. I think that's something that we should take right now. Uh, so let me understand, how do we get that done? And how do we have a sense of urgency about getting this done? How do we this? would require an action by the commission. It's one that, that I support, but I let my colleagues sort of speak for their views. Okay. Uh, is it possible for the United States to lead the world in 5G and 6G if we do not have a robust mid-band spectrum pipeline and like the major economies uh, that we compete with? We have to make more progress on mid-band. When I first started the commission the first four years, we moved a lot of mid-band spectrum out the door. Um, we need to sort of double down and get back on moving mid-band spectrum at the same pace that we did there. I put forward some ideas on how we could do that. Um, I have a spectrum calendar out there, including some mid-bands. Um, we, we need to move a little faster on that. In 2021, Democrats created a $7.1 billion emergency connectivity fund uh, to support distance learning. Is there still a need for this fund given schools have returned to in-person instruction and the E-rate program is already in place? Well, most directly, we still have a lot of funding left over, my understanding, in ECF at, at, at the moment. Uh, so is that funding still needed, or should it be uh, clawed back? Well, fundamentally, we, we should take a, a broader relook at all of these programs, including, to your point, um, the move back to school and see what continues to be necessary. But ECF right now is, is ongoing because the funding remains. Uh, Chair Rosenworcel, uh, why hasn't the FCC implemented the Inspector General's uh, recommendation to request the last four digits of an applicant's Social Security number as a fraud pre prevention tool? Well, we invite any applicant for the ACP to put in their Social Security number information, but as you might know, when Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, it also made eligible for the ACP households with a student on the free and reduced lunch program and the Women, Infants, and Children program, both of those programs do not require a social security number. So what we've done in the alternative is say, well, you've got to prove that you are who you say you are. So you can submit, for instance, a military ID or a passport or something like that in the alternative. So the ACP applicants uh, should provide the last four digits of the social security number? They are, you have to prove you are who you say you are. So you can provide a social security number, but you could also provide a taxpayer identification number or a military ID like I just described. 
Okay, well, good. I've got a couple more questions. I will submit those, but I'm out of time, so I'll yield back. Mr. I thank the gentleman. He yields back. The chair now will recognize the gentlelady from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Matsui for holding this important hearing, and to all of you for, I know, your favorite thing to come before the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, as COVID-19 pandemic highlighted, the work that you all do is vital to our economy, our emergency services, communications networks, and national security. Broadband and spectrum access remains essential for every American to participate in rapidly innovating medical services, educational opportunities, crucial protections, the digital economy. So I want to focus on a number of important issues. I know you've talked about some others, but I'm always worried about emergencies, domestic abuse, and things like that. Many of my colleagues today have mentioned the expiration of the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority. Tied to the laps in the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority are critical investments in the next generation 911. These delays are having a significant impact on our ability to upgrade 911 capabilities and modernize our emergency services infrastructure, including innovations that could have a, a profound impact on vulnerable individuals. Chairman Rosenworcel, how would advancements made through investments in NG911, such as text to 911, assist in protecting survivors of domestic violence and strengthen steps the FCC is taking to implement the Safe Connections Act? I really appreciate you asking this question. It is vital that we upgrade 911 in this country. The 6,000 public safety answering points that are out there that take our 911 calls, many of them are still operating in the analog era. We want to make sure that they have all the technologies that we would expect them to have in the digital age. So if you call, you should be able to reach out and have a discussion. You should be able to text. You should be able to send pictures and information. Your healthcare records should be available. All of those things are possible with next generation 911. They're going to make it easier for more people to safely reach out for help in crisis. So that's why I think the Spectrum Reauthorization Act, spending on a nationwide upgrade for 911, is so important. Thank you. Recent reporting has indicated that a number of websites offering mental health crisis resources across the country that are tied to the National 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline have shared data, data with Meta due to information collected by pixels on their web pages. In many cases, users tap on a dedicated call button on these websites that will immediately reach 988 or a local line for mental health services. But the use of this site or button also triggers these pixels, which then transfers data to Facebook, sharing intimately personal information about the user during this time of need. These pixels and other external ID factors can then be used to match web users to their Facebook accounts or other profiles for advertising. I think we can all agree that anyone reaching out to these services for help wants to remain anonymous and should be able to remain anonymous. Madam Chairwoman, how is the FCC working with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and other organizations associated with the National 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline to ensure that personal information of Americans utilizing the service remains anonymous and protected through whatever medium they use to seek aid. We have developed a very close relationship with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration because I want to make sure that privacy and confidentiality are part of all of our policies. But the situation you described is totally unacceptable. It, I'm not clear that it violates the Communications Act, but I'm fairly confident it violates some law, maybe involving health care. And so we'll go back to our enforcement we really do need, and I mean, identify what's going on and see what we can do to help you fix that. And if it's not us, we want to be able to direct you to the right it, people to do it, it. It's a major issue. I had a suicidal young person who then got public, and it became worse. Lastly, um, I'm co-chair of the 5G and Beyond Caucus and the AV Caucus, so I'd like to focus a few questions on promoting the new technologies of future and help close the digital, digital divide. Uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, do you see the advent of fixed and mobile 5G as a tool for connecting communities and promoting developing technologies like autonomous vehicles? Is this a good development for consumers? Yes. 
Okay, the rest of the commissioners, because you should have a chance to talk. Do you agree with the chairwoman? Is this a good, good development for consumers, yes or no, and why? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, I agree as well. Uh, yes, I agree, and it will also help them in their working lives as we expand the ability of 5G to enhance industrial production and keep us competitive. Thanks again to all of you for being here today and for your service to the American people. Uh, and while we're talking about the FCC, Congress needs to do its job and fund the Affordable Connectivity Program. It continues to be a critical lifeline for families, and we need to ensure it remains funded. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio's 12th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here uh, today. Uh, my first question is for Commissioner Carr. Uh, the FCC is an immensely important agency regulating media, auctioning, and relocating spectrum and helping get Americans connected, amongst many other things, within their purview. During a recent markup, this committee passed Mr. Carter's H.R. 3557, the American Broadband Deployment Act. I included an amendment in that bill that would help streamline the permitting process for deployments over or under rail crossings. Commissioner Carr, outside of congressional action, what can the FCC do to streamline the permitting process for deployments across rail crossings? Uh, well, thank you, Congressman, for your leadership. I, I think the legislation that you've introduced has identified a, a real serious problem. I've tried to spend a lot of time in this job on the road meeting with the telecom crews that build out fiber and other connections. And right from the get-go, they said that railroad crossings is just a really difficult uh, issue in terms of the timelines of getting approval and the costs. And I think our jurisdiction to do something about that is, 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 would be very stretched. Um, so I think that we really need something like your legislation to pass. Okay, thank you very much for that answer, um, Madam Chairwoman. Um, the FCC under the Trump administration took a number of steps to streamline the permitting process with their rulemakings, specifically when it comes to wireless deployment. Do you plan on retaining these rules and interpretations once the FCC returns to its full compliment of commissioners? Compliment of commissioners? Uh, to the extent that they've been upheld in court, yes. But I, I do want to also acknowledge this, that we've got to streamline permitting procedures, but we got to be mindful that most people don't like Washington telling them what they can and can't do in their own backyards. And we're going to have to figure out a way to cooperatively work with communities to get this network infrastructure deployed. And I don't want those relationships to be hostile friction-filled or aggressive, we're going to have to work with local municipalities to make sure next generation network infrastructure gets out there. Okay. Look forward to that. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Commissioner Carr. I wanted to follow up with you on the permitting process. process. What lasting impact has the Pi Commission's action on broadband deployment? I think it's been incredibly successful. If you just look at small cells, for instance, back in uh, 2016, New small cell builds in this country had effectively flatlined. We had something like 708 new cell sites go up. I think some of the data I saw from 2019, for instance, showed that we had 64,000 new cell sites go up. So infrastructure reform really matters, and it paid off during COVID-19. Uh, we had robust, resilient networks because of those infrastructure reforms. Flash forward to Europe, their top regulators were asking their streamers to degrade the quality of their video content because they were afraid that the continent's networks were going to break. Um, our network performed very, very well. I think at least part of that is due to the infrastructure reforms that were uh, that led from 2017 forward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my next question is for Commissioner Carr and Commissioner Simington. You've been sitting there pretty quiet. Uh, shifting gears to spectrum. Coordination between the FCC and the NTIA is crucial when the FCC is deciding on spread spectrum action. Congress has made several efforts at increasing coordination between the FCC and the NTIA, be it through my bill, the Spectrum Coordination Act, or through the recent Spectrum Auction Reauthorization Bill approved by this committee. Commissioners Carr and Simington, can you tell me how coordination with the NTIA has improved throughout your time serving on the commission? Well, it's always a challenge. At the end of the day, NTIA is, is intended to represent a lot of federal users. And the entire spectrum process in this country works better when federal users filter their views into NTIA, and then NTIA with authority can represent the views of uh, federal users to the FCC. And then we do what Congress intended, which was we make the final decision on whether this spectrum band can work here 
or what power level. The challenge we've seen, this isn't unique to this administration, we saw it in the last administration, is once the FCC's experts call the ball, uh, we see a lot of collateral attacks on that decision from federal agencies. So I think what would be good through legislation or otherwise is reinforcing Congress's decision that the FCC is the central authority for making spectrum allocation decisions, and that NTIA needs to be empowered um, to really speak for the federal agencies with one voice. Okay, Mr. Simmonson, you have 20 seconds. Uh, thank you. Uh, I used to serve at the NTIA. The NTIA is, um, is a very sophisticated organization scientifically, but it's a small organization. It has much, uh, it has 200 people as opposed, to, as opposed to tens of thousands at some other agencies. If other agencies freelance and don't operate through the NTIA and don't treat the NTIA as a convening center for their views, then the FCC will in, in be unable to coordinate with anyone. Okay, thank you both very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, the ranking member. I have, uh, <clears throat> as I've listened to my uh, colleagues' comments and questions, I have uh, some that were originally questions, and I'd just like to now comment uh, on your responses and reemphasize that they're important to me as well. Uh, the first is the 988 number and the issue with um, uh, responding to the uh, area code versus the actual location. So let me just weigh in on uh, that also being important. The second is this issue of uh, 2.5 gigahertz spectrum and the industry um, not feeling like the uh, FCC has been responsive and in answering their questions. I know you've answered that, so I'm not gonna ask you to answer that again, but I just wanna weigh in on the importance of also communicating with industry and, and helping them understand your position. Uh, the third, uh, Chairwoman, I noted uh, your recent letter to Senator Grassley recognizing the agency's lack of jurisdiction in the online video marketplace and rightly demonstrating regulatory restraint. I just want to echo those sentiments and caution the commission from taking action that would attempt to shoehorn an old TV regulation into the growing MVPD uh, marketplace. Uh, now to a, a question or two. Uh, Madam Chair, the FCC Inspector General and Government Accountability Office has issued reports about fraud and the lack of anti-fraud controls and if uh, affordable connectivity program the Inspector General has made some recommendations for improving the program's oversight. What steps has the FCC taken in response to those reports and safeguards program and safeguarding, safeguarding the program from waste, fraud, and abuse? Thank you. We are doing everything we can to make sure that this program runs with, uh, that it's strong and it's run with structural integrity. Remember, Congress asked us to set up the affordable connectivity program in 60 days. In 60 days, the people sitting before you built the biggest broadband affordability program ever. And so when the Inspector General makes recommendations, we take a look at them and we identify what we can implement and how fast we can implement. We put new fraud controls in, we've changed our vendors for different language and uh, translation services. We've also made adjustments to make sure that all of the uh, that there are no commissions for those who reach out and try to sign people up for these services. We've taken a lot of their recommendations and put them to work. Thank you. Uh, Christian Carr, did you have any response on that? You know, look, we have to obviously stay very vigilant on this. One idea that, that I've thought about is, is attempting to, uh, to, to formalize the process of the FCC Commission's consultation with the Inspector General. I've spoken to the Inspector General before we've moved forward, and the Chair and her team have as well, but that's not formalized. I think one idea maybe going forward is to when we have big spending initiatives above some threshold, or maybe all of them, we consult with the Inspector General and we put their recommendations in the FCC order and we can respond to it. Hopefully we're agreeing with them, uh, but we can at least respond to what the IG said. If we formalize that process, I think maybe that could help us catch a little bit more of this on the front end. I Thank do you. wanna acknowledge that in our draft affordable connectivity program order, we shared it with the Inspector General to take in those kind Thank of recommendations. You. Thank you, let me switch gears a little bit. I represent a large rural uh, district um, they're very concerned about rip and replace, um, as all of us are. Um, the funds are not there for them to complete um, their work. I'm just curious to, to all of the commissioners, have you heard from providers that will be shutting down their networks if they don't receive the full reimbursement? And, and um, what, are you, what are you hearing and, and what solutions do you have? Madam Chair. Uh, we're gonna need help from Congress to make sure we fully fund this program so that we can take this insecure Chinese equipment out of our nation's networks. Right now, those small carriers that rely on this program have a really hard choice. They can rip that equipment out of their networks, but be paid 
a limited amount of money to do so. Or they could leave it in and make sure that those networks are not secure, and it's not something that we're going to be able to tolerate in the United States. Not a good choice. We're going choice. to need your help on this. Yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, his 33rd district, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, really uh, thank the panel for coming in and talking about their vision for uh, connectivity, uh, for uh, digital connectivity, particularly here in the United States, and, um, and the affordable connectivity program is what I really wanted to focus on today. Um, one of the reasons why is because it's such a great example of a program that is working, whether it's in an urban district like the one that I represent or in a rural district like many of our Republican colleagues represent. Uh, it is uh, tremendous what it's doing to change families' lives and, and what a positive impact that has made in 18 million households across this country. Uh, people that weren't connected before finally uh, have an opportunity to do that uh, and being able to do it affordably uh, and not have to make the choice between whether or not they should be connected with the rest of the world or whether or not they, you know, have to, you know, pay other bills. And so it's just been, it's been a great program. And uh, Chairwoman uh, Rosenworcel, uh, I want to commend you and the commission on setting up ACP and its predecessor EBB uh, so quickly uh, and particularly under challenging circumstances that we faced. Uh, but it wasn't a set it and forget it situation. And I know that lots of improvements have been made to the program. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the media always talks about the waste and the fraud, and th that's what gets the headlines. Uh, instead of the, the 18 million people that I talked about earlier whose lives have been positively changed because of this program, uh, to me, the system is working as it is supposed to be working, uh, and people are connected that weren't before, and that's what we have to keep in mind. Um, can you talk to us, Chairwoman? about the improvements and integrity measures that you have made and implemented to ensure that ACP uh, is on firm footing? Well, first of all, thank you. I know that you played a big role in getting the predecessor to this program, the Emergency Broadband Benefit, set up. And then Congress took a look at that work and decided to continue it, and that's why we have the Affordable Connectivity Program today. Like I mentioned a second ago, we had to set it up in 60 days. Congress gave us 60 days. That's a little bit like, um, building a plane when it's in the air. But we did it, and we have 18 million, 19 million households that rely on it now. So every time we identify a problem, we are swift to make change. For instance, the Inspector General identified a problem with subscribers in community-eligible participation schools. Over the course of two to three days, we shut down that pathway, required additional documentation, did a re-verification of everyone who had previously applied under that uh, requirement, I mean, and we sent uh, any problematic uh, findings off for enforcement and investigation. I think that's exactly what you want. Yeah. You run a program, you make sure it has structural success and integrity, and you do that by taking in any criticisms and acting on them in a fast and expeditious way. Yeah, no, no, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and, um, uh, and you mentioned also in your testimony that current projections suggest that ACP funds could run out within a year. Um, and there are currently, you know, again, 18 million Americans enrolled. If that happens uh, and this program does wind down, what processes are in place to prevent consumers from suddenly losing the discount and facing unexpected bills? And, uh, and when, would it, when, when would providers need to start informing uh, customers in our districts that uh, this uh, benefit is no longer available? These are very good questions, and we are taking a look at all of them right now. First things first, we want to make sure that Congress continues to fund this program. We built the biggest broadband affordability program in our nation's history, so let's keep the good stuff going, and we'd like to work with you to do that. But come uh, this fall, we'll have to make uh, hard decisions about what kind of choices will need to be made to wind this program down if Congress does not provide an additional appropriation, and we're taking a look at all of those issues right now. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, well, I, 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 it's, it's like I said earlier, it's made a, a, a big difference uh, from kids being able to do their homework in a more efficient manner, people being able to explore starting a you know, new business one day. Uh, and as this digital uh, economy continues to grow, we want to make sure that lower income communities uh, can participate because it can change lives. I appreciate your testimony today 
And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Just remind members, votes will be called at 115, and the chair now recognizes. Um, let's see, we have okay. The gentlelady from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. And I guess my first question is to Commissioner Carr. You know, I'm excited about the potential benefits and economic development can, that can happen in my district with 5G. For example, the fixed wireless uh, broadband is quickly growing. And I have mountainous region in East Tennessee. And that has incredible potential for um, unlocking smart manufacturing, uh, precision agriculture, and a whole lot more. So how can the FCC ensure that wireless carriers have the right type of spectrum and other tools they need to get the 5G services to the people I serve? Thank you for the, the question. You know, we need to obviously continue to push spectrum out there. I think obviously the 2.5 gigahertz is one band that we could allow carriers to light up immediately. We also have to be sensitive, not just the FCC, but Commerce Department on the BEAD program, that we allow a range of technologies to compete. At the end of the day, when Congress passed uh, IJA, the Infrastructure Act, they did so making clear they wanted to be technology neutral. So we want a ton of fiber in this country, mm -hmm. but there are pockets where fixed wireless could bridge the digital divide almost overnight. And so we need to leave room for those technologies to compete as well. I know there was, you know, some legislation. I talked to our senators, you know, fiber is probably what people would prefer, but if you can't get it and you need to get up and go on, because there's many rural areas where I have two distressed counties where they have to, you know, drive to Walmart or, or McDonald's to download their licenses. We need something. So, um, and this goes to Chairwoman, as the FCC handles um, more space-related applications and actions at a staff level, it's important that there's a process in place for the elevation of certain decisions to the commissioner level. Some of the decisions are on controversial matters um, that arguably should be made by the commissioners who can be held accountable. And I guess my question to you is, can you please explain what the current practice is for elevating decisions for commissioner level review? Uh, there's a mix of different precedential authorities here. For instance, if the commission has previously acted on these issues or comparable issues, we can assign them to bureau authorities. There are other mm -hmm. times where the commission actually delegates certain tasks to the bureaus. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that becomes before the FCC on any given day, and yeah. we have to figure out how to process it expeditiously. So that takes a mix of commission and bureau level action to do so. Okay, thank you for that answer. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Idaho for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and commissioners for being here today. I'd like to speak about spectrum just a little bit, in particular shared licenses. And uh, with less and less greenfield and clear spectrum available, where is the commission when it comes to pursuing shared license options to ensure federal users like DOD, private users can utilize these bands at even faster speeds. And I'd like to get everybody's input, if I may. So uh, Chairwoman uh, Rosenworcel, if you could begin, please. I think that's a really smart question because we're not making more airwaves. We gotta get creative about how we use them. And I think one of the best exercises of that creativity has been our work in the 3.5 gigahertz band where we've created a hierarchy of rights where there is a military right that they can preempt at any time, but we created secondary rights and sold off licenses. And beneath that, we made the spectrum more broadly available for unlicensed and Wi-Fi purposes. I think that's a model of creativity, and we've got to study models like that and see if we can export them into the future because identifying greenfield spectrum, just like you mentioned, is gonna get harder and more difficult. Chairman Carr? Uh, yeah, I agree with the chair. At the end of the day, we, we need to provide a mix of different spectrum bands, not just you know where it is, low, mid, high, but uh, exclusive use, shared, unlicensed. We have to strike the right balance there. Okay, yeah, Chairman Stark, or Commissioner yes, Stark. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I completely agree with my colleagues. Um, you know, the additional thing that I would say, obviously the physics uh, of it matters, uh, where you are in particular bands. The FCC has outstanding engineering, uh, engineers that we work with, and they certainly keep us well informed. Uh, Commissioner Simington. 
Thank you. Uh, my colleagues have already uh, have already said a number of very very smart things. And I'm going to more or less agree with all of them. I would note also that um, in Chinese deployments of 5G, they often operate in private networks, of which China has a very high density compared to the United States, indoors and at relatively low power levels, thus providing support for manufacturing and other industrial facilities. So that's something we should explore as well. Okay, thank you for that. And that's a kind of a lead-in for where I wanted to go next. And we'll just go in reverse order, if we may, because I'd like to get all of your input on this uh, as well. Uh, and it has to do with the mix of licenses, if you will. So as, as Congress seeks to support FCC's Spectrum Auction Authority, where do you see the value to Americans when it comes to this mix? Shared license, unlicensed, and exclusive licensed Spectrum. What's the value to Americans in that mix? So, uh, Commissioner Simington, if you'd start, please. Absolutely. So, full power exclusive use licenses allow for the most detailed network engineering. And uh, companies that are going to try to cover large amounts of terrain with sophisticated network engineering need the certainty that they have control of that band in order to deploy the huge capital costs of covering an entire country with, for example, wireless uh, telephony. On the other hand, unlicensed spectrum has, is where the Wi-Fi industry came from. It allows anyone to get in and start innovating, and having a mix of, of, of unlicensed spectrum available allows, um, allows for an explosion in diversity of services, sometimes ones that start with very low investment but can grow. As finally, as far as it goes, shared spectrum, um, shared spectrum is, uh, is often the model that we're looking at when there are a number of services that have different operational characteristics and can share the same band or that operate at different times and can be synchronized, uh, can, be, can be offset in time so that uh, there are heavy traffic in one direction when that's what's needed and then at other times they turn off. So for example, a radar can okay. operate. It, we need them all. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Starks. Uh, I, I agree with my colleague um, uh, there, Commissioner Simington. Uh, the two things that I would additionally add is uh, we are also advised by the Technical Advisory Council, which pr frequently gives us great ideas. But in particular, the thing that I would foot stomp is Wi-Fi has produced billions and billions, if not trillions, right. of additional dollars of economic impact uh, to the United States and to Americans everywhere. Right. Got it. Commissioner Carr, once again, it's the regarding the mix of licenses, value to Americans. Yeah, I agree with the, the comments that, uh, that my colleagues made. I thought Commissioner Simonton put it. Very well. You know, we've made in the near term, we've made a lot of progress on unlicensed. For instance, we opened up uh, about 1,200 megahertz of spectrum and six gigahertz. Obviously, we can always open up more, but we need to continue to put emphasis on some of the licensed spectrum as well, given some of the recent unlicensed progress we've made. And I think that'll get us back to a more balanced approach. Thank you, Chairman Rosen Warsaw. Um, I think my colleagues have all made good points. The bottom line is that good spectrum policy requires a mix of licensed and unlicensed services and exclusive and shared use propositions. Great. And we constantly have to be recalibrating to make sure we're making the right balance in our skies. Thank you. Uh, uh, commissioners and Mr. Chairman, I do have more questions, but I'm out of time, so I'm going to send those to you in writing. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Well, thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all our witnesses for being here today. Um, with regard to all of the commentary surrounding Spectrum, I just want to say ditto. I know that so many of my colleagues up here today have, have touched on this issue, so it, 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 there's no need for me to go into that. But uh, I, I just want to open up with saying I think very few Americans really understand how much their everyday life is impacted by the work of the FCC. And so thank you to you all for everything that you have done and will continue to do. And I'm just gonna jump right into uh, the Cable Act. So as you all know, in 1992, Congress passed the Cable Act to promote competition and provide consumers with expanded video choices. Today, the robust media marketplace has expanded far beyond cable TV, providing consumers for many options to watch videos and beyond. Now, with the possibility of a fifth commissioner joining your team, I would caution the FCC in taking any action that would apply outdated, burdensome regulations to a flourishing market place. So, Chair Wynn, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong. Rosenworcel? Nice. All right. Under former Chairman Pai, the FCC eliminated many unnecessary rules on the media industries. Do you commit to not reinstate any of the rules eliminated in the media modernization order? I think there were more than 30 rules that were developed that were eliminated or at least 30 proceedings on it to be candid with you I'd rather go back and look at them than give you a uniform answer now but many of them were outdated 
and it was an effort to adjust them and modernize them for the times. As you acknowledge, the ways we watch have changed, and I think that's a fair thing to recognize. So just to go back to that, so you have no plans to institute new rules or regulations in this space? Um, we don't have anything before us at the agency involving those issues right now. Um, and I, um, I'm, I'm not certain if you're referring to something specifically. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and also, while, you, while I've got you, the FCC is required to conduct its quadrennial review of media ownership rules every four years, and I believe the most recent review is overdue. When can we expect to see that review from you? We're working on it. We also started the um, last year's quadrennial review in December, and I know that this issue is also before the court in a mandamus petition, though the court has not actually asked us to respond to it yet. Thank you. Commissioner Carr, anything to add? Yeah, I do think we need, to, we need to get going on a lot of those proceedings, including the, the quadrennial review. Um, there's a lot of you know, progress we can make. At the end of the day, you know, our guide star here has to be continuing to create an environment that's going to lead to investment in local journalism, local TV, local radio. When you look at newspapers across this country, something like 2,200 closed down over the past 15 years, and, I, and I'm worried that newspaper could be the future for local radio, local broadcast. It doesn't have to be that way but we can't um, impose regulations that are gonna make it more difficult for uh, local broadcasters to thrive. They have an incredibly important uh, business model, a lot of upside. Uh, we just can't saddle them with too much regulation. I agree. I, I am very much a proponent of less government is better government. So I, I appreciate that. And I know that this issue has also been hit on a few times today, robocalls. I, like every American, despise the robocalls, the scammers. Uh, but scammer text messages in particular. Um, I know, Chairwoman, you and I have discussed a couple of ways we can address some of the robocall issues, but can you tell me one specific thing that you need from us in Congress to stop the scammer text messages? Sure. As we all know, the scam artists are moving from calling us to texting us, yes. and it is extraordinarily annoying and really dangerous because people click on that junk really easily and find that uh, some bad actor can then go, you know, drain their bank accounts, or cause them real harm. One of the things that I would like us to be able to do is to take the traceback consortium that this committee made available in the Traced Act, which is a group of carriers that actually identify junk calls on the line. I'd like to take that technology and apply it to texting. Wonderful. We might need your help to do that. I'm not clear whether or not we can make that happen under the Traced Act but it is absolutely something that's been successful for scam calls. I'd like to now apply the same approach in the texting context. Wonderful, thank you for that. And we'll definitely follow up on, on that. And finally, I know we're gonna make a wild jump here into prisons, so stay with me. Uh, the contraband cell phone issue in our prison system is a very serious issue. I represent several of these prisons, both state and federal in my district and all of the major crimes committed have begun with a conversation, and nine times out of 10, it's facilitated with a cell phone. So what can the FCC do specifically to encourage the adoption of technologies like managed access systems to prevent the illegal phones in our prison systems? Yeah, if you'd answer that in about 10 seconds. Last, last Sorry, year, we adopted sure. updated rules for managed access systems that were intended to streamline the process so that more correctional authorities can avail themselves of those systems. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yep, thank you very much. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognize the gentleman from Texas 11th District for five minutes. And again, uh, we will probably be called here in about three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, Chairwoman, it was nice to speak with you as well. It's good to see everybody uh, here today. Um, I represent the fourth most underserved uh, district in the country. And, and the other districts that are, you know, one, two, and three are adjacent to me. So what I'd really like to speak on behalf of not just my own district, Midland and Odessa, San Angelo, the rural areas, the national security area that we talked about, uh, energy production, agriculture, but also places like Lubbock, places like Amarillo, um, and, and a lot of West Texas throughout the Permian Basin. Um, I, you know, just kind of looking back at the funds that uh, have been distributed, I just ran into my predecessor, Mike Conaway, in the halls uh, walking here, and he brings me back to 2009, you know, in the conversations when he was uh, chairman of the Agriculture, Agriculture Committee uh, a couple of years later, um, with the amount of funds that have been put towards getting 
access in rural America. Um, and, you know, it's hard to think about 6G when we're still, you know, waiting for 25-3 service uh, in, in my own district. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the things we have to, to focus on is the competition, commercialization, the competition with China. It's very important. So obviously 6G is important. Um, but uh, when it comes to the maps and when it comes to prioritizing rural needs, whether it be precision agriculture or the production of energy, uh, Chairwoman, can you um, maybe give us some assurance that, uh, you know, before doing 6G that we're going to have, you know, actual service, just broadband service, just in general, uh, in places like my district? So with respect to wireless, we've talked a lot about um, maps for wired, but not wireless. And in fact, we are actually developing the nation's most accurate wireless maps right now, too. For the first time ever, we're getting all of our carriers to up give us data based on the same metrics and same systems and the same assumptions. So what we're trying to do is identify where there is service, where you'll get bars today, and where you won't. And once we get that down, we'll be able to also identify what areas are gonna need support for wireless service everywhere. One of the cool new tools we have is the FCC's uh, speed test app. If you uh, put it on your phone in an anonymized way, you can check the uh, speed you're getting on your phone, but it will report right back to us and tell us where you're standing and what kind of speeds you get. So we're actually taking advantage of some crowdsourced information to make sure our in-house mapping initiative for wireless is even more correct and even more accurate. Is that mapping process taking into account community interaction and, and commercial partners as well? Well, uh, on the wired side, we've done a lot of community outreach because a lot of states have, and even localities and municipalities have broadband task force and broadband offices. So we're developing those ties right now because I don't think we're gonna be able to produce all this data in Washington without asking people check and tell us what's happening in the communities where they live. Okay, great. Commissioner Carr, anything to add to, to that? No, I think as we discussed, you know, we have really an unprecedented uh, influx of federal dollars designed to end the digital divide, and so it's not a funding challenge at the problem in terms of the build out of infrastructure. Um, it's a policy implementation. We've got to focus on the places of this country that have zero megabit over zero megabit. I want everybody to get the latest and the greatest, whether it's 6G, whether it's uh, 100 megabit service, but we have to focus first and foremost on the places that are still on dial-up, still on, you know, almost nothing, because if we focus there, um, we can make a big difference with the funding that we have right now. Yeah, Chair I, yeah, I just want to make a plug for another map that we have, which is called the broadband funding map. Congress asked us to create it, and most people don't even know that it exists, but it's a map of all these programs that we are now presently funding, not just at the FCC but at the Department of Commerce, the Rural Utilities Service, the Department of Treasury, we are trying to take in every single program and produce data on a single map. So you can see what the government has funded and you can go check and see what's happening in those areas and you can also identify areas that we might have missed. I think that that map is just as important as our national broadband map and it's one that I'd certainly want this committee to be aware of as you look at our progress. Well, thank you. And when we look at those maps, um, you know, again, I'm going to highlight the national security issue uh, of providing food for this country and providing energy. And I want to make sure um, that, as we spoke about on the phone, that there's no uh, bias that is inflicted by um, this agency, by the FCC, uh, when it comes to climate agendas and things that we've seen. That there are biases that are out there, uh, but providing broadband, providing coverage to the Permian Basin uh, and the surrounding areas is very important. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield back. Yeah, the votes have now been called. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to the commissioners for a very interesting hearing. Uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, uh, you said some things that I thought were, uh, were really spot on in your testimony. You said that broadband isn't nice to have, it's need to have. Uh, you also said you don't have a fair shot in the 21st century unless you have broadband at home, which I completely agree with. Uh, and that's why uh, I think it's so important that you've created the broadband availability map to really highlight the need to extend infrastructure in parts of the country that don't have it. Uh, I've, in perusing that map, I couldn't help but noticing that there's a huge hole in coverage right over my district, both in 
uh, fixed and in mobile broadband. And I know that a lot of our conversation at the hearing today has centered around affordability of broadband. But uh, my point would be, it doesn't matter how affordable broadband is if you don't have access to it, and many of my constituents don't. Uh, my constituents have kind of a unique problem in that so much of my district is in public ownership, uh, either National Forest or Bureau of Land Management land. Many of my communities are com completely landlocked. I've got one city that's completely surrounded by BLM. I've got another city that's completely surrounded by National Forest. And problems arise when we try to permit the extension of broadband infrastructure through public lands. And Commissioner Carr, uh, I know that you, uh, in answering Congressman Joyce's question on this, you got into this a little bit. So we're supposed to have a shot clock of 270 days on the permitting of broadband infrastructure through federal land. But uh, our agencies right now commonly ignore that shot clock. So the question, and I'll start with you, Commissioner Carter, the question is what can be done about that? It's a challenge, we've, we've, we've tackled this You've tackled this through legislation multiple times, Congress has, and we have a shot clock right now on these entities and it's not being abided by. I think it kind of has to go maybe to the top of these uh, agencies and, and really bring it to the, the, the leadership's attention that Congress is serious about these deadlines, imposing some consequences for missing the deadlines, because right now there isn't one. I mean, I cons consequences like what? You know, it, it could be sort of consequences for funding, uh, perhaps something that would be enough to get the attention of leadership, because these are, you know, they're good meaning public servants, but they're, missions are directed on totally other issues and their career isn't advanced by moving quickly on broadband permitting. So we have to find some way of, of aligning the incentives, whether it's carrots or sticks, uh, as my colleague says, um, to make sure that they're abiding by those shot clocks. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, I've introduced a bill, H.R. 3340, the Granted Act, that would simply say, uh, if you have a permit that has met all of the other requirements but the shot clock has expired through the inaction of a federal agency for the permitting of infrastructure uh, across public land, then the approval is, is deemed granted. Yeah. And I, I think that that would incentivize federal agencies to not ignore the shot clock. And I know it's a, it's a heavy handed approach, but I don't know how else to get their attention. Um, maybe we'll look at also uh, tying it to, to maybe some funding, but you know something needs to be done. I completely agree with you. Uh, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Rosen uh, Worsel, which in your defense is no worse than Obernolte. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, has really changed about the way that consumers uh, get uh, information, particularly video services over the last few years, is the, the advent of streaming services. And uh, I know you're very aware of the, uh, how the industry has transitioned there. So uh, questions have arisen recently about uh, whether or not the FCC has the jurisdiction to regulate these new online video marketplace distributors as in the same manner that you have regulated uh, them that uh, in non-streaming formats in the past. So do you believe that the FCC has that jurisdiction and do you intend to regulate streaming services the same way that you do other MVPDs? Um, I think the answer is that our authority extends only to what Congress provided us in the 1984 Cable Act and the 1992 Cable Act. And I think it's fair to assume that none of us in this room are contemplating the kind of streaming services we have today when Congress passed those laws. Right. Thank you. That's, that's a pretty clear answer. Uh, well, I know we have some people waiting to, to go on and we have votes. So I want to thank you all for your dedication to extending broadband into rural uh, districts like mine. It's uh, very much appreciated. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate our panelists being with us today. Chairman rosen Warsaw and uh, the rest of the commission, good to see all of you. Um, the committee uh, has passed my legislation, the Alert Parity Act, to formalize the way the FCC licenses supplemental coverage from space when providing emergency alerts and 911 service. While there have been several partnerships announced that seek waivers of the FCC's rules for more advanced services, this burgeoning topic also raises several interesting questions about spectrum use. One such question pertains to the geographic areas required to offer supplemental coverage from space. I wanna make sure that whatever the FCC does, my constituents 
in rural Eastern and Ohio are not left out because rural carriers don't have the spectrum over the entire U.S. So first question, uh, Chairwoman, would the FCC's proposed supplemental coverage from space rules exclude smaller carriers from bringing these services to the rural communities they serve? The short answer is no, but the longer answer is this. As we try to combine terrestrial services and satellite services, we're gonna to have to deal with a lot of potential interference issues. That's why our lead proposal in our rulemaking on the single network future focuses on spectrum where a single carrier holds all co-channel licenses in an area. Okay. But we I'm also proposed ideas for how other carriers could work together to help avoid that interference and participate in this growing okay. area of spectrum. All right, so, so will you commit to working with our committee to ensure that the FCC's actions in this space are not unnecessarily rushed and that they strike the appropriate balance of encouraging innovation while also providing certainty? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Chairwoman Ro uh, Rosenworcel again, one area of geopolitical competition with China is in the space sector. Similar to how China has sought to leverage their terrestrial telecommunications infrastructure, they're also working to build out uh, satellite broadband to directly compete with the United States. Regulatory certainty is something that would help to ensure that U.S. maintains its lead in this critical sector. For instance, right now there are applications uh, that sit for months at the FCC before any action is taken. If we want to continue to be the global leader on technologies like satellite internet, I strongly believe we need to move much faster. Can you explain to us why the FCC has not been putting out applications for comment on a more timely basis? I agree. When I came to the agency, I noticed that we had a tremendous amount of satellite applications before us. I reorganized the agency, created a space bureau. I increased those who review those applications by 50%, and we set up a rulemaking to try to identify what criteria are necessary so that we could put them all out on public notice faster. So we are in the process of streamlining this, and I think we're on the way to being successful at okay. doing that. Um, well, you've answered my other question. So I, I think with that, I'm gonna yield back a Entire one the gentleman yields. 27 seconds. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Arizona. Ms. Lesko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here today. Uh, radio amateurs voluntarily and without compensation regularly provide important public services, especially emergency and disaster-related support communications when commercial infrastructure has been destroyed by a hurricane, forest fire, or similar disaster. In 2013, radio amateurs petitioned the FCC to delete an obsolete rule that limits the speed with which they can transmit digital messages. Although the commission agreed in 2016, in a 2016 notice, that the obsolete rule should be deleted, and although it also waives the rule when hurricanes or other disasters threaten, the rule still exists. Uh, we are the only country in the world that has a data limit of this type. As you may know, I have twice introduced a bill that directs the Commission to replace the data limit with a bandwidth limit. This would allow radio amateurs to engage in modern data communications and increase efficient use of their spectrum. Chairwoman, and any other members that want to answer, when can we expect the commission to act on this matter? Or will it be necessary for me to pass my legislation to get the commission to act on this, what I think is a simple matter? Well, I appreciate you giving voice to amateur radio. It's important for hobbyist use, but as you mentioned, it can be also used in emergencies. And we've seen lots of demonstrations of people doing just that and help, really helping out. So we had this petition a while ago and um, it's about amateur radio and how it is a shared use, so that we have some restrictions on how amateur radio hobbyists can use it. Some of those involve a symbol rate, some involve a bandwidth restriction, and there's a lot of conflict in our record about how we should update those. 
But as you mentioned, we last did a rulemaking on this, and I think it was 2016 or 2017, and I think we should refresh that record so that we can move ahead and maybe get to this issue uh, before you have to introduce some additional legislation. My microphone. Do you have any uh, estimated timeline on this? Because as you know, there are hundreds in my district alone of amateur radio operators. And I've gone to some of these emergency uh, training uh, events where they help hospitals. And I, I think they're very vital. And this seems from what they described to me to be a simple and logical change. And I was wondering what your estimated timeline is on this. Well, the thing is that the record that we have on it is stale, and the old record, there was a lot of divide about exactly what changes should be made to uh, the bandwidth restrictions here. So I think we're going to have to update that and then get back to you. Um, I wish I could give you an estimate without updating it, but I think the right thing to do is to update that record. And do any of the other commissioners have a comment on if we should do this? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Congresswoman. Um, I, I had a number of friends in the uh, Amateur Relay, uh, Radio Relay League who, uh, who sent me copies of, uh, your, of your introduced legislation with uh, you know, big smiley faces on them and such. It's, uh, you know, I, I think this has very, been very well received by the community. Um, obviously, the whole concept of a bowed rate is a, is a little bit outdated. I don't want to be precipitated on how best to reflect the, on how best to update the record. I think the chairwoman is proposing the right approach, but this is certainly something we should take seriously. Well, if, if, if you did what is um, complementary to my legislation, you would have thousands of people that would be very happy. And with that, I yield back. Generally, yields back. I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents list. Without objection, that will be in order. I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond to the questions promptly. Members should, mit, should submit their questions by the close of business on July 5th. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.